Uh, hello, mm -hmm. everybody. Uh, so we are uh, op opening our uh, session, a uh, section of our uh, ghost free section. <laughs> section. <laughs> and then the first uh, to talk will be by Professor uh, Geltsov, uh, who will talk about Palatini kinetic scalar tensor theory. And uh, so I will share this uh, his, his his talk, and, and then he will he will continue next uh, as a chair. Yeah. So please. Thank you. Please. No. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hello. I'm happy uh, to be now in Rome, virtually in Rome. In Moscow, we we have 32. Uh, one feels just uh, is to be physically in Rome. But still, uh, I'm sorry. Let me uh, arrange a, a bit in the screen. Okay. Uh, I will talk about uh, the theory which was introduced by us, by me and uh, Sofia Zhirkova, just at the 15th Marcel Grossman meeting uh, in, in Rome. And the series is following. The action is well known. It is the action of um, derivative recouplet to reach a tensor uh, scalar field phi mu phi nu uh, derivative. Uh, and uh, it is uh, well known that the series, this is uh, for general uh, values of, uh, of coupling kappa, kappa, kappa one, kappa two, does not belong to ghost free Harndesky class, uh, but uh, just uh, has the third derivative since the equations of motion. It is evident from the Einstein form, <clears throat> the Einstein tensor from this Lagrangian. It is just kappa two plus kappa two kappa one by, by this combina combination of higher derivatives. And um, uh, also the scalar equations contains higher derivatives. But uh, in the case uh, when cup, uh, two cup one plus cup two is zero, uh, zero, it is just the case when third, third derivatives in the Einstein equation vanish. Uh, and uh, the scalar equation become also the first, second order only. Now, um, uh, this theory was uh, interesting uh, in the Cosmological application, it provides an inflationary sol uh, solution without potential. Uh, it was shown by Sushkov in 29. And uh, mm, it also contained one whole solutions shown by Sushkov again. Uh, but uh, the same action gives rise to a class of ghost free theories for any values of two coupling constant if the action considered it as Palatini action. And this was our suggestion, the MG15 conference. Then we found some analytical solution to this theory, uh, which are Harrison-less and uh, regular without uh, singularities. The cosmological solution to also without singularity, it is actually of uh, the uh, initial singularity is replaced by um, genesis kind, kind thing, uh, which is a feature which can be attributed to violation of neck. Uh, but here we would like how the generic solutions, uh, generic uh, on the, some classes, of course, a class static spherically symmetric space time, uh, whether, whether they contain other type of solution like black hole or holes and other. Uh, it was shown that the series conformally is dis disformally dual uh, to uh, the old conformally coupled R phi, phi two uh, theory, which also violates snack. But uh, here in our theory, uh, violation of neck is stronger some, somehow. So this, uh, these are the, <clears throat> the equations uh, variation uh, over metric that uh, Palatini Einstein. Uh, and the connection has to be uh, defined from this uh, equation, which obtained uh, under variation by uh, uh, over connection. Uh, 
And it turns out that uh, the theory is uh, mm, this formally related to, it contains Einstein frame. Uh, and uh, the scalar field is always is not minimal in general for generic kappa one kappa two, but uh, it doesn't contain uh, higher derivatives. Uh, this is some details how it happens. So this is uh, an equation after variation of the action. Torsion can be, uh, it, it is projective invariant theory. A rich tensor is coupled only symmetric tensors and uh, it can be consistent put to zero. And then uh, the equation uh, looks like uh, can be transformed into the equation of covariant derivatives for the second metric, hat g mu mu. And then uh, the Palatini connection will be just the um, Levi-Civita connection of, of the second metric. Uh, now one can find the transformation from uh, the first to the second metric just by inverting this uh, relation because manipulating with this equation, one can uh, find that the new metric is uh, just this formal transformation of the, of the first one. And there are two uh, conformal factors here. Uh, one contains the sum of coupling constant, uh, another contains only one coupling constant. And uh, and, and that the uh, special thing is that in in this frame, uh, in which is the second metric for uh, connection, uh, defining connection. It is the frame, uh, which is an Einstein frame of, of, of the series. That's just the transformation looks. So if you transform the action, you obtain Einstein action plus uh, scalar part. The scalar part generically is non-canonic, uh, non-canonical because lambda is a function of x and x is a function of phi. Uh, derivative and so on. So uh, also it can be shown that uh, transformation is invertible. To invert this, uh, we need first to express uh, x, x uh, in terms of x, uh, x hat, which is the contraction of derivatives of scalar field or the second metric. And uh, this equation is uh, just the cubic equation. It can be solved analytically. There are two uh, complex branches of solutions and one real. And uh, so it is invertible. We can explicitly solve this equation and we can explicitly solve the uh, in, in inverted equation. So uh, the only thing is that uh, we have factors which enter, which enter this transformation factor lambda, small lambda and capital lambda, which depend on field. They depend on metric, it is uh, complicated functions. Uh, and uh, it turns out that they can, can, can be zero and then uh, the special point of transformations. Uh, if you consider the class of solutions, so generically it's a boundary of this class usually. So it is, it is just a, uh, some uh, restriction on, on, on the space of solutions. Uh, Inside each branch where it is one-to-one -one correspondence, we have in the new frame, we have an Einstein equation. And there is an exceptional case when kappa one is opposite to kappa two. And then the Einstein equation becomes that way. It is a minimal theory, which is especially fortunate. And the scalar is a simple Blumberg equation. After that, you can, uh, check that uh, the, the Palatini equations are in, in their original form. Uh, they are indeed uh, satisfied in that, in that way. Uh, and uh, also, uh, in, in, we, we're still working within a Palatini framework, so one can uh, say about uh, in which uh, frame is here, but here it is a, a the only frame is uh, G, uh, G uh, the metric is uh, 
metric which determine connection, but uh, the action is such that the first order and second order formalism for this metric is equal. So they are uh, they produce the, the same equations of motion. Uh, so we can think of, of this theory as an Einstein theory in metric formalism too. Uh, then, so we have two frames. We have initial metric and, and Palatini connection. And we, can, we, we call it uh, Jordan frame and we have Einstein frame, uh, which is uh, just uh, especially simple in, the, in this exceptional case. And now our problem is uh, to show, uh, to find the generic spherically symmetric uh, static solution just in that ex exceptional case. When uh, in Einstein frame, we have minimal coupled scalar, minimally coupled scale. Now, uh, so first uh, idea was uh, to, to solve uh, directly einstein palladini equations within uh, this ansatz, but uh, the equations are terribly complicated even if you start with, with, with this and try to express in terms of uh, some metric function as already in static ansatz, it is, uh, terribly com complicated, but uh, then uh, it is not necessary because we have one-to-one -one correspondence with Einstein, with Einstein frame, and here uh, equations are trivial. Uh, so what we need now it is just to to find generic solution of these equations, uh, and uh, to do that uh, we integrate it again. I think that in the literature there are many. Uh, many such uh, calculations, uh, the system uh, very simple, but I, I, I don't remember if there was especially uh, emphasis on, 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 uh, on the generality or, or genericity of solutions. So the uniqueness of, of the solution, which is known, um, maybe was proven before, but it is so simple, so better do it uh, just. I can show almost all calculations on the screen. So we parameterize the metric by two functions, uh, special gauge, uh, not R square, but R because it, it, is, it leads to simpler equations. And these are rich tensor. Uh, so um, we, we start integrating the system uh, carefully, uh, uh, accounting for all integration constants. So the first integration constant is here. It, it is something C, then there is a uh, integration trivial, which is shift of uh, coordinate, still we keep it. Uh, there is one integration constant in uh, scalar equation. And finally, the, there is a one, one of the chain equations is constant, which just uh, relate these uh, functions and, and parameters too. Uh, finally, we derive a separated equation for R, R, this is the uh, square of the radial function and the metric. And uh, this equation can be integrated by exponential parameterization. Uh, to solve it, we just substitute R equal to exponential of U, and U satisfies this uh, nonlinear uh, second order differential equations, which is solved. Uh, which doesn't contain u, only u prime. It is solved on, uh, with respect to u prime and then integrated that way. Finally, we obtained here two constants, c, q, and the previous constant a here. And this is a generic equation we have. Uh, now we can transform this formula in simpler to simplify it just passing uh, from tangent to exponential of u. And uh, this uh, we find surprisingly, for us it was surprising that it's precisely the form of uh, Fisher, uh, Fisher solution, Fisher uh, Janis Newman Winnicott uh, solution. So uh, by passing, in passing we, are, uh, uh, we proved that a spherical symmetric solution of Einstein scalar, uh, minimally coupled scalar is asymptotically flat. Second, that it is given by two parametric family by, of uh, Fisher. And the parameters are the radius 
B, which is the radius of singularity in, the, in these coordinates, and the power index gamma. Uh, now, uh, there is a constraint which uh, really relate our previous parameter to these two. So finally, and uh, one uh, parameter more, which was a shift of coordinate, it is just also a trivial thing. So finally, this two parametric uh, solution, G, uh, FG and uh, W, is generic solution, generic solution of, of a static spherically symmetric system. And now we have to go to the Jordan frame and to see what happens in, in, in our uh, original theory. Um, and this is to perform this uh, transformation from which we have to find a factor lambda and uh, new components of the metric. In any uh, case, you can solve the equation uh, with respect to R, R component or with respect to lambda, but you have cubic equations. So, now we, we can start by GRR, okay, which are based uh, uh, cubic equation, then solve it this way. And these two form of X, uh, they continuously uh, pass one to another. Now other uh, Jordan frame metrics are just conformally related, GTT and G. Uh, theta theta conformally related to uh, with this factor, which is now uh, which is now known. So uh, finally, th this means that we have we have found a solution uh, analytically, but the analytical form uh, is is uh, not very uh, inform informative and such uh, com combinations of non-integer power, uh, cosine, or cosine, and so on. So finally, we have to uh, make numerics uh, to understand what, what does it mean. Uh, first, we can find that uh, uh, our disformal transformation uh, preserve an asymptotic flatness. So this uh, G, uh, F, uh, G and V W solution was asymptotically flat and singular at the point are equal to B for all gamma, for all gamma, the invariants are diversion. So it is a strong singularity uh, on would-be horizon. Uh, sorry, it is just a misprinting. There's no G here. Now, um, now what, uh, what we are looking for? First, we, are, uh, we want to know whether uh, there are wormholes. Uh, the, the Q, is a function which is uh, the square of radial functions, that is g theta theta. And uh, so we try to solve this equation analytically. And this also uh, not, not very helpful because uh, equations are analytic, but complicated and the function con contains uh, roots. Uh, at, at least uh, Maple, neither Mathematica, cannot simplify those uh, equations and the answers. So we need for, uh, we check whether this function G theta theta may have a minimum, local minimum. And uh, what happens numerically, it is it has local minimum here uh, for values of gamma, which are uh, greater than one half. So the uh, threshold is just uh, gamma equal to one half. And this is uh, more than one half, the three value more than one half. And the metric function asymptotically uh, is uh, raising li like uh, R square, but here it's raising another way, but it is it, it going to infinity again. Uh, if uh, this is just uh, gamma equal, one half, and there is nothing uh, special. Is no no uh, infinity, no zero either. So it will be just the special solution, which is a regular soliton. And uh, for gamma uh, below one half, uh, the solution uh, just uh, this uh, radial function goes to zero, so it will be singularity. This is uh, GRR. Also, it shows that all, all 
uh, solutions for R greater than B uh, in, in positive region. So there are no horizons. And uh, it is also here uh, seen from G uh, to TT. The, the GTT, it uh, also positive, and the, the behavior of scalar field that has singularity, it is singular, of course, it, in the point of R equal B and the symptomatical flat. So, uh, without any, uh, it's monotonous functions in, for, for different uh, gamma, and uh, this kappa. Is the coupling constant, which remains the unique coupling constant, uh, uh, all the curves uh, moving, uh, moving for a very small uh, kappa, uh, and then for uh, bigger and big one, uh, the position of minima they appear, starting from. Uh, this is for k equal uh, zero. And uh, so it is singular. Now for small k, it is not singular. It is already going to infinity. For gamma, more than one half. It is still finite value for one half. And then singular for, uh, for uh, less than one half. And uh, this growing coupling constant, uh, the position of this road. So this is this road of the wormhole supposed wormhole, and uh, it, it moves uh, to the right. And the, uh, the units, uh, like uh, the unit, uh, the radius uh, of uh, B, uh, B equal to one here. So it, it, all, all the, those minima are close to the singularity in the initial Fisher Janis solution, about 10%, uh, 10, 10 15, not more than, uh, 10, 15 percent of, of this radius, then it starts growing. And this is some numerical values for position of the wormholes road for different gamma and for k equal two. Now, uh, what is uh, remains to, to be done? First, to see if the internal space, uh, which is uh, in those coordinates, the small part of small, small piece of space be, between the position of uh, minima, uh, position of this road, suppose road, and the, the point which uh, correspond to singularity of uh, Fisher. Uh, and one finds this relation. So uh, small volume between turning point uh, of a uh, radial function and uh, the position close to singularity by <coughs> some delta uh, from the singularity. And one can see that uh, one over uh, one minus two gamma. So for gamma uh, greater than one half, uh, this goes to uh, infinity. Uh, dominates a negative term and uh, the, the volume, space volume of the region, uh, which is supposed to be the second sheet of the wormhole, is it is infinite. And uh, this I, I comment a little bit later. Well, to uh, understand what is the nature of this space, we can calculate the Einstein uh, tensor, mixed component of the Einstein tensor and find, find from there effective energy density and principal pressure in, in this uh, Riemannian-like uh, interpretation of this ge geometry. And we find the following, the U is the distance uh, from B, is the distance from uh, B and uh, it, it is small. So uh, asymptotically, this term may be either uh, divergent or uh, zero. Uh, when you go, going to, to zero. And uh, in, in our case, uh, gamma greater than one half, it is just a wormhole case, uh, it's positive uh, power. So this term will be zero. If we obtain negative energy, which is constant. For uh, pressure, radial pressure, we have the same terms, but both with minus, sign minus. And again, if uh, we have wormhole regions, this goes to zero and the 
it turns out that energy density and uh, radial pressure are both negative and equal. This is uh, is a characteristic of geometry. Uh, no, now the Ricci, the Ricci scalar and Kretschmann uh, scalar for in the wormhole region are uh, no, are finite. So this is perfectly regular solution. Now <clears throat> we also calculated geodesics both in the sense of metric and the sense of uh, connection. Both of them are uh, again, uh, showing that the throat is transparent. So, so one can, that's traversable wormhole. Now the boundary value is gamma equal to one half. Right? We analyzed it before, but uh, it is interesting that the <clears throat> powers in the Fisher form uh, are just one half. It, is, it looks more symmetric. And in this case, the uh, Jordan frame metric will be like that. So it is uh, Xi, which is also U, uh, but here this Xi. So uh, by transformation of radial con con coordinate, it will be two-dimensional Minkowski space. This is two-dimensional, and this is a sphere. So we have a regular center, which has geometry uh, Minkowski 1-1 one, one, and the sphere. Now, uh, Ricci also uh, in this frame will be negative and constant. U term goes to zero. And the, ah, now, now uh, we pass to naked singularity case. So it is a boundary between the second class when, the, uh, when gamma is uh, less than one half, it will be naked singularity. Then it is seen from here the each scalar diverge. Also, uh, the volume goes to zero. So it will be just shrinking uh, volume space. So we understand that uh, this uh, branch of solutions of generic solution correspond to uh, naked singularities, but without horizons. So horizons, there are no, uh, but not bad, but uh, the whole class of solution doesn't contain the horizon. Um, and also Kretschmann in the wormhole case, it is finite, but it is diverging in the case of singularity. So finally, our uh, answer is that uh, the whole class of generic solutions uh, of our Palatini kinetic theory are the following is either Asymmetric wormhole. Asymmetric because of one, one asymptotically flat region is usual Minkowski space, but uh, mm, uh, but the, here internal space is not Minkowski. It is not asymptotically Minkowski. It is asymptotically non-flat, uh, which was described above. So we have uh, part of solutions is asymmetric wormhole. Uh, part of solutions are naked singularities, also asymptotically flat. And uh, between them is a regular okay, kind of soliton solution. And no solution contains horizon. So our conclusion that this is a particular, uh, special, uh, particularly simple uh, Palatini theory, uh, which is related to rather complicated, uh, complicated metric uh, theory, uh, hostly, but um, our Palatini theory is ghost free. Transformation from it contains a Stein frame where uh, it is minimally coupled scale. The transformation is reversible. Then we, are, we were able using this Einstein, simplicity of Einstein frame theory, where we are able to explore the general general solution of the static uh, spherical symmetric class. And it turns out that there are no black holes at all. There are warm holes. There are naked singularity. Between them lies a solution which is just has a regular center, a kind of solid solution, a cylindrical type uh, geometry here. So thank you very much. Um, okay, okay, please. Uh, we have uh, time for, for a short question or for a couple of short questions. So so if, uh, if uh, anybody has uh, questions, so... Uh, so, if no questions, uh, can I ask you to show your your Lagrangian, uh, the the statum Lagrangian? Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, so you have, and what is the relation between kappa one and kappa two? Kappa For us, it is kappa, two. kappa one plus kappa two are zero. Kappa one plus kappa plus two, kappa two uh, zero. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, fine, because if uh, if uh, kappa one is minus one half of kappa two, such that yes. it becomes an Einstein tensor. Yes, then, yes, and then, then it is Hrndesky. I, I started from that. Yes. No, no, no. Well, it is Hrndesky, but, but in the, but in the Palatini approach, it uh -huh. is equivalent after, after this formal transformation, it, it is equivalent to vacuum general relativity. And then uh, as far as I remember, and then uh, the Palatini, and then, and then there is no equation for the scalar field. So the scalar field is arbitrary. Uh, in this case, you, you, you choose any GR solution, any vacuum GR solution, and then you add any scalar field you, you like, mm -hmm. and then <laughs> you get a solution of your original theory. But, uh, but this is only in the case if kappa one is equal to minus one half kappa two, if this is Hordensky. Uh, your case is, is different. Yeah, okay, fine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, right, I understand. Uh, uh, okay, okay. So, so the I'm reason is the... just that here disappears a nonlinear term. Right, right, right. And so your solution uh, for, which is, looks like a fissure, is it? So it's not quite different. It's, it's different from fission, right? No, no. It is. Uh, it is. Uh, it's precisely the same. Yes. Precisely fissure. Yes. And the only That's thing that, is. yeah, we, we we were just looking for constant and and uh, we just proved that it is unique uh, and asymptotically flat. So the assumptions were the spherical symmetry and and static staticity. Uh -huh. It is a unique uh, solution in that case, static, static spherical symmetric solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so if uh, there are no more questions, then I suggest that we move to the next talk uh, and then you, 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 <laughs> you will cheer. You yes. Know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, uh, but... but I can announce it. So, so please, the next speaker uh, is uh, Adria Delom. Uh, is this correct pronunciation yes. of your name? Yes. So, so please, uh, uh, please, uh, Dmitry Vladimirovich. Uh, yes, stop, yes. Stop? Right, stop. right. Uh -huh. Okay. And then, uh, Adria, so you, you 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 share your screen. Okay. Uh, okay. And then just uh, and then just start. Okay. Mm. It it is enough just to stop this uh, sharing and then R right right anybody so can yeah no no, no. Y yes so as as soon as as you stop sharing anybody can uh, anybody can do it mm -hmm. right right yeah, yeah. so uh, so you 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 don't see is no. Normally at the bottom, the, the, I have a share screen button. Mm -hmm. And in your case, I do I you have, have permission to my computer? Uh, no, no, no. Permission? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. No, 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 no. Usually, usually you don't need one. For example, me. Uh, let me show. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I can share my screen. Okay. Now, the moment, now the moment you see my screen. I stop it, and I don't have any sp special permission. I'm not a co-host. Okay. Do you do you feel so, now? Oh yeah, now is 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 there? Yeah. Okay. 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 <coughs> make it full screen. Full screen and make it full screen, please. Uh, okay, you start. No, fine. You start. So what, what's <laughs> happening? <laughs> yes, you can. You can speak. 
Yeah, right. You can. No. Adria. I hear nothing. We can hear you. You can talk. Please, uh, please, uh, please start. Maybe he has. Uh... Ah, his microphone is. No, no, we can hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, yes, now yes. Yes, 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 yes okay. Do. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, it should work. Okay, so um, I am uh, I am just finishing my PhD and uh, I tried to sum up some recent results that I got with uh, Jose Beltran, uh, a collaborator from the University of Salamanca. And these are about the presence of ghosts in generic metric affine theories of gravity. So <clears throat> let me just uh, start by introducing to you what uh, metric affine theories are and uh, some motivations to consider them at least historical ones. So <clears throat> the idea behind metric affine theories is that uh, we generalize the, I mean, they, they uh, you start from the geometric perspective of the gravitational interaction so that uh, you understand GR as a theory of, of the space time and uh, gravitational dynamics is tied to curvature basically, okay? So from that perspective, you try to generalize uh, GR because you know that there are some uh, problems with finding a complete uh, UV theory and, and there are singularities and there are issues that we want to resolve, okay? So one of the ways that one can go starting from the geometrical perspective is to extend the geometrical framework in which this theory is formulated. So <clears throat> uh, this extension consists on the following. So in GR we have that the space time is a Riemannian or pseudo Riemannian manifold which is a manifold with a Lorentzian metric and the affine structure is given by the canonical connection of this metric, so the Levitsky-Gita connection. So this extension of metric affine theories basically allows for generic connections to be present and uh, unties this link between metric and connection that, uh, that is enforced in the metric framework, right? So in, in, in this class of theories, our space-time would be a smooth manifold with a Lorentzian metric and an independent affine connection. So there would, be, there would be this new geometrical object. This leads to a Riemann tensor, which has only first order derivatives of the connection, right? Which, uh, uh, well, it kind of, it, it's promising regarding some uh, results with higher order derivative theories. So the new, um, all these new geometrical features can be encoded in these two objects, condom metricity and torsion, right? Which are the antisymmetric part of the torsion and the covariant derivative of the metric. Are you and changing slides or it is the same? Uh, I am. So do, do you see the changing? Uh, we, we, we see just the first page. Oh. No, we see, we, see, we see only one page. Okay. So oh, see. It's okay. I can do a full screen, yeah. Oh, so now you feel the change? Sorry, hello? Now, now we see, yes. Okay, so uh, as I was saying, in, in this theory, the space time is a smooth manifold with a Lorentzian metric and an independent of connection. So there are classical results regarding higher order curvature theories, which say that they would be generically uh, propagating those degrees of freedom due to the Ostrogatsky theorem, because there are higher order derivatives in the Lagrangian. And this is due to the fact that the Riemann tensor in, met in the metric framework has second order derivatives of the metric. So that unless one considers some log-log combination, then Ostrogatsky stability will be present. On the other hand, in the metric affine framework, the Riemann tensor only has first order derivatives of the connection. So this is uh, somehow promising in, in, in the sense that there, there doesn't need to be higher order derivatives of the metric in the Lagrangian, and maybe this can save us for the, from the Ostrogatsky stability. At least it was uh, uh, the point of view of, of some people who came more from the geometrically oriented background to start considering this theory seriously because maybe they can find some quadratic or 
uh, polynomial theory, which is normalizable in the same sense as the style theory used to be, or is, sorry. So uh, we, we try to address the question of, uh, are these theories really free of ghosts, right? So there's some, uh, one can gain some intuition by, by using the following uh, theorem. So you can always decompose a general affine connection in, in any space time which you have a connection and an independent metric as the Levitivita connection of this metric plus two terms that have to do with the non-metricity and torsion, right? So that any theory that you can write in terms of metric affine uh, uh, Riemann tempus, you can always rewrite it as a metric theory plus some uh, new matter fields that would be non-minimally coupled to the geometry in general, right? So this formulation uh, leaves aside the geometrical perspective and it, it, uh, it views the theory from a more uh, field theorist oriented perspective, but it sheds a lot of light into the question because you realize that from this perspective, the theory is just a metric theory with higher order derivatives of the metric. And then you also have these non-minimal couplings to curvature of the non of the non-metricity and torsion tensor, which will also introduce yet additional pathologies uh, uh, due to the Ostrogaski theorem again. So in principle, from this perspective, it doesn't look very promising to, to wonder about uh, absence of, of ghosts in these theories. However, there are, uh, and there, there have been known uh, many examples of ghost-free subclasses of metric affine theories. For instance, one has Ricci-based gravity theories in which the Lagrangian is an arbitrary function of the Ricci tensor and the metric, and it has to be the symmetrized Ricci tensor due to pro projective symmetry, as we, as we will see. There are other subclasses uh, with geometric constraints, as uh, was derived by Percacci recently. And there are also some extensions of the Pancaria's gravity theories. Uh, of course, within which based gravity, we can find FFR theories or Eddingtonic's fiber neutral and, and all these uh, well known models. And uh, among these classes of theories, which are both three, uh, they have interesting properties like singularity resolution at the classical level in cosmological as well as spherical symmetrical grounds. And uh, there are also arguments for which one could think that this could be effective theories that encode quantum effects of a quantum space. -time. Okay, there's a nice- it, Excuse me, is it okay so that we are looking to always uh, the page three? Okay, so let me just go away from full screen so that maybe it works. That's already six, we did not- something doesn't work but we, we did not see the pages four and five okay so i will go i will go out of full screen mode because otherwise i think it, it doesn't work for some reason ah it's a problem of full screen go. yeah because i think uh, it only allows me to share the acrobat uh, window so when i go full screen it does not identify it properly okay so i was saying that there is this always this decomposition of the affine connection in terms of a, of the metric connection plus some other terms and this allows to write any action as a metric theory with some extra non-minimally coupled matter fields, which will generally excite uh, Ostrogradsky instabilities, as we will see later. So in principle, this idea that uh, metric affine theories uh, uh, were free of ghosts is not very promising. However, as I was saying, there are several examples of theories of the metric affine class which are ghost-free, and they have nice properties, OK? There is also this idea that these theories could be encoding uh, quantum effects uh, by, by basically by, by, being some, by, by being able to describe some effective space time in which the um, features of a possible uh, space time microstructure could be smoothed, uh, smoothed out in the continuum limit in terms of torsion and metricity. Okay, these ideas come from the fact that. Uh, this is actually happening, and it has been already tested in, in crystalline structures, where one can see that if one wants to describe a crystalline structure in the, in the continuum limit, if the structure has defects, then these defects translate into uh, an affine connection of, of well, this crystalline, the, this, um, this continuum limit describes the crystal as a manifold. Okay, and, and if there are defects in the crystalline network, like uh, you, you can see in the picture, then uh, in this manifold, there are, there are non-trivial torsion and metricity tensor. Okay, so one could, in principle, naively or, or heuristically uh, uh, transport this analogy to, to some uh, effective theory of a quantum space, right? But this is only, I mean, 
there is nothing uh, rigorous do, done in this direction yet. But it's it's uh, it's a uh, well, it's an interesting uh, idea that that motivates us to study the the effective metric affine theories. Okay, so let us go to to the to the central part of the talk. So, in order to to um, show the presence, the generic presence of ghosts in metric affine theories, I will be dealing with this generalized Ricci-based gravity class because it's a simple example and it will be. Uh, it will be illustrative enough so that we can see uh, this generic presence. So first of all, recall that projective transformations are transformations of the connection of this kind. So you add a vector to the derivative index of the connection. And then this con this connection, these transformations only transform the anti-symmetric part of the Ricci tensor, which is not symmetric for a general connection, right? So, and, and they transform the Ricci tensor by the field strength of the projective mode, okay? So you can see that the symmetric part of the Ricci tensor is invariant under projective symmetries, right? So if one considers generalized Ricci rate gravity with projective symmetry, then one should uh, symmetrize this Ricci tensor here, okay? But we will go uh, with the general case. So the field equation of the theory look like this, and uh, this Q is a new object that one can uh, build by basically performing a field redefinition of the metric. Okay, this uh, derivative of the Lagrangian depends on the metric and the Ricci, and it allows to write the metric G menu as a function of the new object Q and the Ricci tensor. Okay, so by playing around with uh, the equations, one, one can see that okay, the, conne the connection equations are algebraic uh, equations that can be solved in terms of the metric Q, of the new object Q, which will be some, some uh, Einstein frame metric as we will see. Okay, so if there is projective symmetry, remember that uh, we symmetrize the Ricci tensor here so that this object is also symmetric, okay? And then in this case, this equation tells us that the connection is the Levitivita connection of Q, of Q uh, plus a projective mode, which is not unphysical because there is projective symmetry. So in this case, we arrive basically to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the case where the connection is just the one given by GR if uh, Q would be uh, governed by the Einstein fever, right? okay? In the non-symmetric uh, case, where there is no projective symmetry, then Q is not symmetric and the connection cannot be exactly solved, uh, or, or at least there is no uh, straightforward solution. And uh, it resembles to the connection equations that one gets in non-symmetric gravity theory, which is already known by propagating path uh, pathologies, okay? so. We will analyze the, the, the pathology provided by this theory by going to its Einstein frame as follows. Okay, so to do that, one uh, takes this action, okay, in here and linearizes it with respect to the Ricci tensor by introducing this auxiliary field sigma. If one considers a variation with respect to sigma, the field equations just tell us that sigma is equal to the Ricci tensor. So that the action basically is the, the same as, as before and it has the same dynamics. However, one can see that uh, by defining now the object Q like this, this action can be written as the Einstein-Hilbert action uh, or Einstein-Hilbert-like action uh, for the object Q and the Ricci tensor of the connection plus a potential term involving the stress energy tensor of the matter fields uh, derived from here and the Q metric. So we have eliminated the original metric by, by uh, a field redefinition of Q in terms of, of, uh, of uh, sorry, of G in terms of Q and uh, Sigma and then the matter fields on shell when, when the field of definition is on, is on shell, okay? So by basically by, by performing a field of definition and integrating out uh, the constraint equations, one arrives to this form of the action for, for these theories where Q does not need to be symmetric and will only be symmetric in the case that there is projective symmetry, right? So this is basically the action for non symmetric gravity theories. And uh, now we can analyze um, what is the case for, for, for this scenario where there is no projective symmetry. Of course, if there is projective symmetry, it is just GR with a non-minimal coupled, non-minimally coupled matter sector. But uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is known to be cost free and unless the matter sector uh, uh, propagates some pathologies, okay? But in the non-projective invariant case, then this Q can be expanded as a symmetric object plus uh, an anti-symmetric part. And we have considered uh, we, got, we have considered these terms to be to be 
uh, to take into account quadratic field definitions, right? So we consider the anti-symmetric part of this object perturbatively. And then we basically introduce these ansatz into this action, the Einstein frame action of the theories. And we get, we arrive to this, uh, to this, to this action, this perturbative action in terms of the anti-symmetric part, where we see that the projective mode of the connection does not have a well, uh, a well-behaved kinetic coupling. And it, it only, I mean, it's, it's kinetic term is, is a non-standard one because it, it, it couples only through the anti-symmetric uh, piece of the, of the metric, okay? So this non-standard kinetic term is going to give us problems, but there are also dangerous couplings between these two forms representing the anti-symmetric part of the, of the Einstein frame metric and the curvature of the, Einstein, of the symmetric Einstein frame metric. And these couplings, unless they satisfy some uh, particular relations among their coefficients, are known to be in general pathologic. So <clears throat> to start with, let us go to a flat uh, limit where Q is just the Minkowski metric and take the decoupling limit for the, for the two-form field so that we recover uh, the gauge invariance and, and uh, encode, somehow encode this longitudinal mode into this B, B field, okay? So by diagonalizing, uh, we plug this here and then we can analyze the action in terms of for, for let's say for the projective mode and this uh, and this third mode of the of the two form and we can see that what the relevant sector of the action looks like this so this would be the kinetic term for the two form which is gauge invariant and then this would be the kinetic term for the b and uh, the, the third mode of the two form and the projective mode after the diagonalization, we can see that one of the kinetic terms always has the wrong sign. So this will give rise to a, a spin one, a massive spin one ghost, basically, introducing two pathological degrees of freedom. Furthermore, if we go away from the flat background, as I was saying, these couplings to the curvature will be in general pathologic and will excite osteoblast instabilities due to the second order derivatives of the, of the curvature tensors, which when they couple to, to other fields, need not be uh, uh, um, a total derivative in the action, so that they cannot be integrated out as in the case of GR. So to see this from another point of view, uh, consider extra degrees of freedom. Uh, I mean, consider, consider just writing the connection as a uh, Levitschekita connection of some symmetric metric of the, I mean, this symmetry metric is the symmetric part of the Einstein frame metric and another piece, right? And we now want to see how, uh, what, how is this other piece being made. So uh, we basically introduce these ansatz into, again, into the Einstein frame action of the theory, sorry, in here, okay? And we obtain uh, the following action, okay? So you again see here this uh, non-trivial, I mean, this would be the non-trivial kinetic, the, sorry, the non non start and kinetic term for the projective mode. And this will encode the couplings to the curvature and the, between the curvature and the two form. To see that more explicitly, let us just redefine the connection by stripping a projective mode from it. And then in terms of uh, this redefined connection, the relevant part of the of the of the action, oh, sorry. Uh, this should be around a flat uh, around a trivial B background, I believe. So let us, let us consider a trivial background for the two form and the relevant sector of the action after doing this, uh, this splitting for the connection reads like this. So we see that there is this non-standard kinetic term for the, for the projective mode and then a mass, a mass term uh, where this M is somehow a mass tensor for the two form, right? Again, by diagonalizing, we see that either the kinetic term for the projective mode or the mass term for the B field uh, have the wrong sign, so a ghost appears uh, in the spectrum, okay? And uh, note that this uh, M tensor needs to be trivial in, in, in the case that uh, we consider a trivial B background. By going to arbitrary backgrounds, uh, we ask the question of whether B can act as a ghost condensate, okay? So to do that, we again consider uh, this, uh, this would be the relevant sector of the action, and now we diagonalize uh, by a more general transformation, a field redefinition, sorry. Where this lambda, in order to diagonalize the, the kinetic sector, has to satisfy this, okay? And then the relevant part of the action looks like this. 
or the only difference is this lambda here uh, from the action before. Okay, this lambda was trivial before, and this m was also trivial before. So, because these two objects have to satisfy this relation for diagonalizing, for, for uh, if, if we want to diagonalize the kinetic se sector, then they have to have the same signature or super signature, if you want. So, uh, this means that again, either this term or this term would, would have the, the incorrect sign. So, the ghost uh, would manifest either in the projective sector or in the in the B sector. Okay, and uh, we can also see. Sorry, you have five minutes left. Okay, so we, we can also see that the connection will have this uh, five minutes. Very form. Okay, and then uh, if we solve uh, the field equations, okay, and this would introduce uh, generically pathological uh, terms like uh, second covariant derivatives of B coupled to B and so on. Okay. So this is just uh, seeing the same as before, but from another point of view, okay? So B cannot act as a, as a Gauss condensate uh, in, any, in any way in, in, in these theories, okay? So another question is, can matter, can matter couplings uh, heal the Gauss? So to see this, we can see that the general solution for the connection in presence of matter fields takes this form, okay? So all, I mean, all, all of these results are derived in, in, a, in a work with uh, my collaborator, Jose Beltran, in, in, in case anyone is interested. So the solution takes this arbitrary form where this A is basically a combination of, of symmetric metrics and, and identities. So we see that the matter coupling will not be able to heal the problematic uh, uh, nabla B couplings. And Furthermore, they will probably introduce further decay channels so that uh, in case that you treat the theory as an effective field theory, the instability time would, uh, the characteristic time for, for the instability to develop would reduce, okay? So, uh, mm -hmm, okay. Uh, there are other ways in which we can think of healing uh, the instabilities. For example, we, we saw in our work that vanishing, imposing vanishing torsion leads to a ghost free Einstein Broca theory for these generalized uh, Ritchie based theories. Uh, the same happens if we, if we use these generalized vector distortion geometries where the, where the distortion and non metricity but of a special kind. And if these coefficients satisfy this relation, then the theories are ghost free. How, however, we saw that if we impose vanishing non metricity as opposed to vanishing torsion, uh, this, this case does not yield like a theory because this constraint is not able to, to um, impose uh, dynamical constraints on the, on the problematic of freedom, right? And other relevant cases, uh, we saw that these results also apply to IP theories of this form. And uh, uh, let me comment that there are, as I was saying before, there are some classes of theories which have been uh, seen to be ghost free. At a perturbative level around Minkowski, this is a recent result by Perkachi and Regin. But the, uh, this is not enough to, to, to ensure stability of the full theory around arbitrary gravitational backgrounds. Okay, so let me quickly comment on general metric affine theory. So, why do these results generalize? So, as I was saying in the introduction, we can always rewrite the Riemann tensor of the connection as a, a function of G, derivative, second derivative of G, and then covariant derivatives of uh, non metricity and torsion, and then uh, non metricity and torsion itself. Okay, so this is a three index tensor field. This is a three index uh, tensor field anti-symmetric in two. This is symmetric in two. In general, these objects uh, cannot couple freely to, to the curvature. They, they cannot couple non minimally without exciting low degrees of freedom. This is well known, okay? And these second order derivatives for the metric. Uh, uh, will also be a source of Ostrogransky instability. So in general, unless all the couplings between this new mat uh, matter degrees of freedom and the metric curvature satisfy uh, well-known Vordensky or beyond Vordensky or, or whatever um, regular uh, tune, I mean, whatever set of fine-tuned coefficients that, that, uh, that um, uh, imply that the theory would be uh, goes free, then unless this is happens, the theory will propagate degrees of freedom in, in some sector or the other, okay? So, moreover, uh, one can see by considering effective, uh, the effective field theory of a general metric affine sector that uh, this, um, this, the necessary restrictions on the coefficients cannot be uh, reached by imposing uh, uh, symmetries 
or at least symmetries that I know of. Okay, so even if one can build a classical a classically stable theory, then this fine tuning of the coefficient would be probably spoiled by quantum corrections. Okay, so uh, just a quick conclusion would be that generic metric affine theories do propagate all the degrees of freedom as opposed to a widespread belief that uh, used to permeate uh, the field. Projective symmetry is necessary to avoid ghost in the rich based class unless one wants to impose geometrical restrictions. The restrictions are not enough to guarantee stability in the general case, of course. For building all three metric affine theories, one needs to fine tune coefficients, but this tuning does not seem to be achievable by imposing symmetries to a, to a general uh, metric affine sector. So it will probably be spoiled by quantum corrections. And uh, this is more or less uh, all that I wanted to, to tell you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Hello? Okay. Questions? Uh, I, I have a question. Um, Yes. So, uh, can you give an example of, of theories which are definitely goes free? Are they more or less similar to Horbinsky or, or not? Well, I mean, if you go, um, so as I was saying, if you consider all this, uh, all the theories in which the action is written like, sorry, like this. So a general function of the Ricci tensor and the metric, where mm -hmm. only the symmetrized Ricci tensor appears here, so that we impose projective symmetry. All these theories would be costly. That includes, uh, I mean, some quadratic Ricci theories, Eddington and Feinborn infill models, all the FFR models, and uh, I mean, in general, any theory which you can write like Jimmy New and symmetrized. I mean, there is also. Uh, I mean, there, are, there, is, there is a class of ghost and tachyon free theories derived by Percaci uh, last year, but uh, I, I don't know. I mean, there is no like compact form of, read, of writing this. So you will have to write the general uh, metric affine sector with, with, I think it has like 20 something coefficients because there are 20 something different combinations of non metricity torsion and, and uh, Riemann tensors at the quadratic level. And then for some combinations of these coefficients, the theories are also ghost free at the classical level, of course. And then uh, there is also a result by, by Shimada and Aoki uh, two years ago, I think, in which they showed that, that by considering uh, higher order curvature of metric affine theories with a scalar, so it would be a scalar tensor metric affine theories. If you impose projective symmetry, they are also uh, close to it. But uh, yeah, I think, I think I don't know, like, Many more examples uh, that encompass, let's say, a, a wide class of theories in which in which in which these theories are of free. Of course, there, I think there are also some generalization of Kornensky theories for the metric affine case. Okay, thank you very much. I, I we have to go to the next talk. Okay, thank you. So just uh, stop sharing the screen, and I invite now Dr. Tahashi Hiramasu with the talk testing gravity with cosmic microwave background in the host. Hello, Just can you hear me? Okay, yes, yes, of course. And can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Good. Okay, can I start? Yes, you may start. Okay. I'm talking on the uh, take, testing gravity with a cosmic microwave background in the DOS theory. I'm Takashi Hiramatsu in Rikyo University in Tokyo. This work is collaboration with Daisuke Yamauchi in Kanagawa University. This, uh, this talk is based on uh, this paper published uh, last year. First of all, I mentioned the uh, motivation of our work. Karim gave us a nice talk on those theory last, uh, last Monday. Uh, as he said, uh, most of the gravitational theories, including the holm theory, can be described as a subset of a type one dose theory, degenerate higher order scalar tensor theory. The action is given this way, so which is 
characterized by eight arbitrary functions on phi and x. X is a kinetic term of the scalar uh, field. Starting from this action, the recent observations of gravitational waves by LIGO and Virgo of the batteries had put con strong constraints on these actions. Taking with uh, these constraints, the action can be reduced to this simpler form like that. Moreover, the higher order de de derivative term, I mean the last term, has been uh, constrained by these works through the long term observations of house terra parser. So our gravitational theory becomes a very simple form. But as pointed out in the Karim's talk, the constraints from the gravitational wave interfering with us might not affect the CMB scale. I mean, the cutoff scale of uh, this theory comes around 100 Hertz in the frequency range. Uh, if we treat the dose theory as a uh, low energy effective theory. So the LIGO's constraints on the dose theory is irrelevant on the CMB uh, scale. Mm -hmm. So there is some room to uh, study the CMB in this, in this uh, theoretical framework. Again, this is the action of the type one dose theory. Uh, sorry, type one dose theory. There are eight arbitrary functions, P, Q, F2, and uh, uh, from uh, A1, A2, A2, C, A4, and A5. Uh, if we employ the uh, arbitrary, uh, sorry, if we employ the uh, ADM decomposition of the metric, the action can be uh, written in this way, the bottom one, in terms of so-called alpha parameters and the beta parameters. There are a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine parameters in the ADM uh, for, uh, formalism. Actually, the alpha parameters and beta parameters uh, in this effective action uh, can be written by the arbitrary functions of those theory, like that. So these two uh, frameworks are equivalent with each other. In the type one dose theory, we impose the uh, degeneracy condition given in this way. As a result, the eight parameters are reduced to six parameters, six independent parameters. The Horn-Desky theory can be characterized by first four alpha parameters up to M, alpha M. And the uh, GLPV theory, so-called the beyond Horn-Desky theory can be characterized by the alpha H parameter. And the dose theory is characterized by the beta one parameter. <coughs> and the uh, Euler Lagrange, Lagrange equations uh, can be uh, ob uh, obtained by the varying the action with respect to the metric perturbations and scalar perturbations. Here, the scalar perturbation is uh, we define the pi, the scalar perturbations by in this way. Thanks to the uh, Degeneracy. Uh, actually, this, these equations have the uh, higher order derivative terms in tar, uh, time. For example, this is a pi three dots, and uh, here is a pi four dots. But thanks to the degeneracy conditions, the coefficients of the higher order derivative terms are related with each other like that. So if we take the linear combination of these equations, we can get the uh, second order uh, derivative equations in time. So there are so many ways to uh, take the linear combinations, but here uh, we have this combination. This is uh, uh, this one. And uh, this one is the time derivative of the second equations. And the third one is the second equations and with this factor. Then we get the second order derivative equations. So rearranging uh, these equations, we finally we get the three uh, ordinary, ordinary uh, differential equations for metric perturbations and the scalar perturbations like that. <coughs> Sorry. Actually, this equation is so uh, wrong to write down like that. 
As for the matter sector, we assume the minimal coupling to the gravity in the matter sector. So the evolution equations for the matter perturbations, uh, here density perturbations and the uh, velocity perturbations for baryon and C CDM and the uh, uh, photons and isotropy. Actually, these equations are the same as those in the GR. Up to here, we are, uh, we are ready for solving the equations for CMB photons, but there are two strategies to treat the, these equations. First one is to specify the arbitrary functions of those theory, uh, P, Q, F2, and uh, AI. <coughs> Then uh, we get the background equations and perturbation equations, which depends on the alpha parameters. And this, these alpha parameters uh, is written by the arbitrary functions in those theory. The second strategy is the uh, EFT approach, effective field theory approach. In this approach, we fix the background geometry to be lambda CDM. And the perturbation equations uh, de depend on the alpha parameters, but this, these alpha parameters are given by the functions of time. So usually we take this uh, form for the alpha parameters in literatures. Then the only parameters characterizing this model are alpha and beta at the present time, uh, represented by uh, alpha i0 or beta 1,0. So I implemented these uh, models in my own CME Boltzmann solver uh, named CME second. But uh, actually, uh, currently this code is closed source, so it's not available for public. But uh, I'm planning to uh, mm -hmm. open this code. So using this code, we can uh, I can uh, compute the angular power spectrum and the bi spectrum of the uh, in the dose theory. Uh, if you uh, if you are interested in your work uh, you, uh, using this code, please uh, read these uh, passwords or passwords. Okay, first of all, I tried to tried to recover the past studied by Damico et al. in the GLP theory as a subset of those type one dose theory. The right panel is the result by this paper, Damico et al. And uh, uh, the top one is a uh, uh, angular power spectrum or temperature, CMB temperature. And the bottom one is the temperature divided by the, uh, normalized by the CTT in lambda CDM case. Uh, and uh, then I can recover, I have uh, recovered the same angular power spectrum with the same values of the alpha, uh, alpha H. Actually, alpha H characterizes the, uh, is uh, characterizing the uh, GLP theory. This is a uh, angular power spectrum for the ranging potential. Actually, uh, we uh, again uh, we recovered them. Next, I will show the result in the type one dose theory in the effective field theory approach. I mean, uh, uh, we solve the background equations in the lambda CDM and uh, we solve the perturbation equations with uh, uh, alpha parameters depending on this function form, okay. So uh, the left top panel uh, shows the CTT I mean the temperature uh, fluctuations. <coughs> As you can see, the beta one parameter, I mean the dose two parameter, uh, affects only on the large scale uh, of the uh, angular power spectrum, which is the same as the GLPB case. Actually, this is a uh, integrated Zuxborough effect, effect. On the other hand, the E model uh, power spectrum doesn't affect from the uh, beta parameter. Actually, the deviation from the uh, lambda CDM is within 0.1 percent. And the uh, bottom right panel is a uh, lensing potential. Actually, it uh, looks uh, looks like the GLPV case. 
uh, like that. <coughs> Up to here, uh, we employed the EFT approach. I mean, the, uh, we, saw, uh, we fix the background geometry as a, a, to be the lambda CDM. Here, uh, we demonstrate a concrete model proposed by Chrysostomy and the Koyama. In this model, the arbitrary functions of those theory are specified in this way. Here, C2, C3, C4, and beta are the constants. The alpha and beta parameters are written by these functions evolve in this way, in this pattern. Actually, the uh, horizontal axis is red shift, and vertical axis is these uh, EFT parameters described by these uh, arbitrary functions. And the left panel shows the uh, Hubble parameter uh, normalized by the Hubble parameter in lambda CDM. As you can see, the uh, Hubble parameter in the past time and the present time is uh, same as the lambda CDM case, but uh, the Hubble parameter uh, is deviated from the lambda CDM around Z is one. Actually, this is a transition uh, from the matter dominant universe to the uh, dark energy dominant universe. Uh, with this, uh, ah, sorry, with this choice of parameters for the Chrysostomy and Koya model, we obtain the uh, angular path spectrum of temperature and the E mode and range potential. The combination of four uh, parameters can leave the Power spectrum are unchanged from the lambda CDM case. Actually, this dashed line uh, is a lambda CDM power spectrum. So please remember the if we are uh, in the EFT case, if we uh, vary uh, the beta one parameter and the other parameter keeps zero, in this case, the uh, angular power spectrum is highly deviated from the large uh, lambda CDM in the uh, large scale. But uh, uh, in this concrete model, so there are four parameters. So this combination can keep the uh, shape of angular power spectrum to the lambda CDM case like that. <coughs> Even uh, the, actually this, in this case, the uh, in this model, the beta one parameter deviated from, uh, uh, sorry, this beta one parameter uh, takes a value about uh, uh, order of 0.1. So this is uh, actually say, uh, similar to this case, but the, uh, uh, this enhancement is uh, highly suppressed uh, due to the other parameters. <laughs> So uh, using this uh, my code, recently I started to try uh, to put constraints on the uh, Chrysostomy and the Koyama model parameters uh, using the Marco chain Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, yeah, we uh, use the Rycliffe uh, calculator provided by the Planck site, uh, which is uh, uh, available in this uh, URL. Oh, sorry. And uh, we focus only on the uh, temperature uh, angular path spectrum uh, with errors uh, from two to 1,000. And uh, uh, we uh, focus on the, these parameters. But the four parameters is uh, are other uh, Chrysos uh, characterized as uh, Chrysostomy and the Quem model, uh, C2, C3, C4, and beta. And here, uh, C2 is fixed to be run. Actually, this is just a normalization of the scalar uh, sector. And uh, uh, we prepare the uh, standard set of the uh, cosmological parameters uh, characterized, characterizing the CMB angular power spectrum. Uh, here is the amplitude of a primordial spectrum and the uh, spectral index and the uh, angular scale uh, of the uh, uh, horizon scale at the last uh, scattering surface, and omega c and omega b. Uh, here, the small omega is related to the large omega in this way. 
and the tau is optical depth. And from these parameters, uh, we can uh, derive from uh, derive the uh, reduced Hubble parameters. And uh, uh, I imp impose the uh, prior distributions for the optical depths uh, in this way. And uh, also, uh, uh, we have to impose some uh, conditions for these uh, uh, Chrysostom and Koyama model parameters uh, for viable. Uh, background solution to exist. So this is uh, just a uh, check uh, in the Ramada CDM case, Ramada CDM model. And uh, then uh, I can recover the uh, usual best of fit parameters. Actually, the, uh, the reduced uh, Hopper parameter is 0 0.68, which is uh, uh, just reported by the uh, Ramada uh, Planck uh, paper. Then this is the uh, uh, Chrysostomian coil model. Actually, uh, I performed the simulations in the just roughly uh, hundreds thousand realizations, but uh, I have uh, nine parameters. So this is not enough to, uh, to uh, get the uh, good distributions. So this is just a preliminary results. But uh, uh, in my memory, it's a first time to uh, put constraint on the, those parameters uh, uh, using the Marukos chain Monte Carlo simulations like that. But uh, actually, I don't know the result, but uh, know the reason, but uh, Actually, the reduced Hubble parameter is slightly larger than the Ramda CDM case. Actually, here 0 0.9, uh, 0 0.76, something like that. Okay, uh, summary. Uh, we studied the uh, cosmic microwave background in the type run uh, theory uh, to test the uh, gravity theories. In the EFT uh, approach, uh, we find the beta one parameter enhances the large scale CMB analysis tropies, uh, similar to the GLP, GLPB case uh, reported by the Damico et al. And uh, uh, to treat the uh, uh, background and the perturbations uh, consistently, we demonstrated a concrete model provided by the Chrysostomy and the Koyama. And, uh, uh, then uh, we uh, perform the simulations for the uh, to get the uh, angular path spectrum. And recently, uh, I'm working on the uh, MCMC simulation to put constraints on these uh, model parameters. Ah, okay, this is last page. Thank you. Have you finished? Takashi, have you finished? Yes, yes. finished, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we passed the questions. Um, let me see mm -hmm. if there are questions. Can, can, what, what can you tell uh, which uh, restriction of, of the, the host Lagrangian parameters uh, we, you have found from your analysis. Sorry. Uh, can you yeah. can you find some particular restriction on uh, the host uh, parameters mm -hmm. from the, from your analysis? Yeah. You mean the EFT parameters or Re Lagrangian yeah. of the, the host? Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, we don't use the uh, original those parameter uh, those actions, but uh -huh. uh, uh, we use the EFT uh, actions. Yes. Yeah, and uh, these EFT parameters, I mean the alpha L, alpha T, alpha K, alpha B, alpha H, and beta one, beta two, beta three, mm -hmm. they can be written by the uh, arbitrary functions of those theory, a one, a two, a two, a three, a four, a five, and the P and the Q and the F two. I see. Yeah. Then 
then, then, then I computed the angular power spectrum blurring the beta parameter or alpha parameter like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a one mm -hmm. result. And uh, mm -hmm. this is another story. Actually here, uh, I uh, fix the uh, dose parameter P, Q, F2, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, uh, something like that. This is proposed by the Chrysostomi and the Koyama. This is another result actually. Uh, actually in the EFT approach, we fix the uh, background, uh, background geometry to be lambda CDM. But in the mm -hmm. Chrysostomi and Koyama approach, I mean the uh, specific sub uh, arbitrary functions. In this approach, the background, we have to solve the background equations. Actually, it, this, it's uh, defined from lambda CDM. And mm -hmm. also we solve the parameter equations. So in this approach, we forecast these four parameters, C2, mm -hmm. C3, C4, beta. Actually these parameters are different from the alpha parameter, the beta parameters uh, in EFT description in this action. Yeah, actually yeah. we, yeah, 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 I talked yeah. Uh, two stories actually. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, rather yeah. complicated. Yeah, okay. A little bit complicated. Sorry. I, I don't see other questions. So let's send the speaker again for end this yeah. talk. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. And we pass to another uh, speaker, Anna Tokriva, as I understand. Yeah. Are you here? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So you have to, Takashi, you have to, have to stop your oh, screen. Sorry. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. already stopped. Let me try to share my slide. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for the possibility to give a talk at this meeting. Uh, the topic of my talk uh, would be related more to the session which was uh, on Monday. Uh, there was plenty of talks uh, on uh, non-local uh, theories of gravity and so on. And uh, uh, my talk is uh, uh, related to some application of the idea of uh, non-locality in the scalar field sector. Uh, basically, what was done by me and in collaboration with Alexei Koshalev uh, is uh, uh, that we built UV completion for Higgs inflation without any extra degrees of freedom, just exploiting non-locality. Uh, let me start from the very beginning, uh, explaining uh, what is the standard model Higgs inflation and why it's so interesting. Uh, the idea of the idea to exploit uh, standard model Higgs field as an inflaton in the early universe has several attractive features. Uh, first, it's a minimal model in the sense that we don't need no uh, we don't need extra fields uh, to make inflation. We already have standard model scalar Higgs uh, scalar field and uh, it can also uh, drive inflation. Uh, naturally small Higgs mass uh, can be kept uh, because uh, if there are no heavy particles, if there are no large contributions uh, to uh, Higgs mass renormalization. In principle, this model can be simply realized by adding non-minimal coupling between gravity and uh, Higgs. And this model uh, written in such a way uh, has approximate, shift, uh, approximate scale invariance in the large field limit and uh, guarantees uh, the stability of inflationary stage with respect to quantum corrections. So the, it provides with a flat inflaton potential and uh, uh, can lead to predictions uh, for CMB data, which agree with uh, the experiment and uh, the parameters which are required for that are uh, that lambda has to be has to take the, its standard model value and xi has to be of order 10 to 3. It's quite large value and uh, uh, this uh, uh, large dimensionless constant uh, actually lead to several uh, theoretical problems of this model. Also, it looks very attractive as the simplest and minimal uh, modification of standard model providing with, fix, uh, with the inflationary stage. Uh, the problems uh, 
the list of problems is here. Uh, models, model becomes non-renormalizable already at the scale of mass Planck over psi, which is much smaller than Planck scale and uh, dangerously close to Hubble scale of inflation in this model. At the scale, uh, three level scattering of standard model gauge bosons enter strong coupling regime and uh, the productivity of the model um, is doubted in this case because uh, production, <clears throat> because uh, during the heating uh, in Higgs inflation, uh, particles with momentum much higher than cutoff scale of the theory uh, can be produced, which means that uh, we cannot describe this process uh, in such uh, kind of uh, easy way. Uh, and uh, another problem is that it's impossible to connect IR parameters with the uh, UV ones because uh, uh, you, because in the standard model vacuum uh, and at low, low energies, uh, the self-coupling of Higgs lambda can have one value and it's, it cannot be definitely related uh, because of non-renormalizability of the whole model to uh, the value of lambda, which is actually connected with the inflationary predictions at large field values. And the last problem uh, is uh, that for central values of top quark mass, Higgs potential is not stable and uh, uh, in this domain uh, Higgs inflation cannot be realized. Uh, so Higgs inflation needs healing and uh, uh, they were proposed several models which can be treated as UV completions for Higgs inflation. First, it was uh, addition of extra heavy scalar field, uh, addition of R squared term of scalar and Higgs inflation. Uh, and, uh, but uh, both models can solve all listed issues, but they all require a new heavy degree of freedom. Uh, so the drawbacks uh, is that the Issue, uh, the, the existing issue that this extra field actually dri uh, drives inflation and it inevitably couples to Higgs field and lead to large corrections to Higgs mass and then fine-tuning problem. Also, there were proposed uh, self-healing scenarios uh, where it was shown that uh, uh, if uh, the theory is treated like it's written uh, in the Lagrangian and the uh, uh, loop contributions are taken into account, then we still have unitary theory. So theory uh, has the property of uh, self-unitarizing, but still it doesn't solve renormalizability problem. It's still non-renormalizable. Non uh, so this, uh, so still we, can, we can't extract exact predictions for, from such of the theory. Uh, Non-local, uh, so, uh, what we introduced to solve the same problem, to build UV completion for Higgs inflation is the uh, non-local scalar field to make Higgs field uh, propagator non-local. Uh, once the scalar field is non-renormalizable, loop corrections generate all possible terms which are not forbidden by symmetries in the Lagrangian. So in general, we have uh, such kind of crazy effect of Lagrangian. Uh, of course, uh, well, uh, the ghost free uh, domain of this Lagrangian is uh, equivalent to Handelsky theories. But anyway, uh, if you compute loops uh, in uh, Handelsky theories, you will get all uh, these terms in the effect of action. And uh, they will appear with any number of derivatives up to infinite derivatives. Uh, so in the sense, all non-renormalizable non scalar theories with high derivatives uh, are likely non-local. And uh, there is an interesting question, are there any classes of good theories? Uh, good means uh, that uh, in principle, I, I can show later that it, they can be even renormalizable and finite, UV finite. Uh, and uh, they would, will not have ghosts. The simplest example is, uh, let's take Lagrangian with non-local propagator uh, with some function of uh, box operator and any arbitrary potential V of phi. Uh, if we take a non-local form factor uh, of the, the following form, uh, where uh, there is an exponent of entire function, uh, for example, if you can, uh, it can be taken that uh, 
sigma of box is uh, box over some scale squared. Uh, then this propagator do, don't this theory doesn't have ghosts. It has only one degree of freedom. But it's important to have here exponent of entire function. Uh, arbitrary form factor doesn't would lead in principle to infinite number of ghosts. But uh, this can be avoided. Uh, such in such kind of theory, uh, uh, it's possible to arrange that uh, the loop integrals uh, would be convergent just because uh, momentum space propagator will have exactly this uh, function of uh, k squared, which can be arranged uh, in such a way that it's falling uh, for, for example, exponentially falling for large values of k. And historically, such kind of models were considered as a way to avoid loop divergences. Uh, also, uh, as another motivation, such structures can appear in few theories derived from string theory theory. And uh, uh, exactly this idea was exploited uh, since the works by uh, Derek and Bullis uh, uh, in, in um, the sense that it can be a possible decompletion for gravity if uh, uh, the gravi graviton Lagrangian is considered to be to have non-local form factors. Then uh, let's turn to the question how we how we introduce non-locality uh, to gain some some good theory as a decompletion for scalar field with arbitrary potential, which also um, in particular, which can be Higgs inflation. Uh, the simplest choice uh, of exponent of uh, box uh, leads to growing three levels scattering amplitudes because you have uh, two uh, vertices and uh, one, one propagator and uh, the, to the total uh, vertex will be grow exponentially growing, uh, which means strong coupling in this theory. But uh, this can be easily solved if the propagator would be taken in this form, exponent of box squared over lambda to the four. Uh, then non-local function cannot be put uh, in this way because uh, uh, here you don't uh, you don't have guaranteed uh, that the uh, field theory is renormalizable. Only if uh, f of box is between two is in the propagator uh, is it's the only acceptable, the only obvious acceptable, acceptable variant for scalar field theory with pro, uh, proper potential to make it uh, renormalizable and even UV finite. How will it work for Higgs inflation? Uh, let's take Higgs inflation in so called tungsten frame, uh, where it has quite complicated form of the potential, which uh, is, behaves as part of the form near zero. Uh, at some range of fields it behaves as phi squared and uh, for large field values where we speak about inflation it has a form of uh, starobinsky of potential for starobinsky inflation uh, and uh, with this potential we can just put a uh, form factor and uh, gain a good model which also predicts inflationary stage uh, why non-locality doesn't spoil, spoil inflation? The answer is very simple. Uh, this slide show, shows uh, looking a bit complicated equations of motion. And uh, the first correction from higher derivatives is uh, written here. <clears throat> uh, since all terms with higher derivatives are proportional to higher powers of slow roll parameters, they can be neglected. Uh, for this reason, and uh, the main solution, the first order solution, uh, is actually the same. So, uh, adding uh, non local form factor would not, uh, in, at the first order of uh, in, in slow roll parameters, would not change the dynamics of uh, slow roll inflation in this model. And this is easy to understand because uh, in the inflationary, uh, the Higgs inflation model has. Uh, approximate shift symmetry in an inflationary region and uh, addition of form factor of non-local form factor do not spoil this shift symmetry because uh, it's just uh, changing of the propagator. Uh, but this model has uh, 
quite non-trivial issue. On top of uh, background, uh, not in the vacuum of this uh, scalar field phi, uh, it, it would uh, really some strange things can happen. Uh, because the kinetic operator on top of some background would have different form. And this form uh, cannot, be, uh, cannot be presented in the form of uh, some box operator multiplied by entire function of uh, uh, exponent of entire function uh, without zeros and poles. And due to this fact, uh, we gain a problem that uh, there are actually more degrees of freedom if we go from uh, vacuum to some non-trivial background. Uh, These uh, degrees of freedom are actually an infinite number of fields with uh, complex masses. Here, uh, it's uh, for the simplest, simplest uh, ch choice of the propagator. Uh, these masses can be derived analytically through a Lambert functions, uh, through Lambert function, which has infinite number of values. And uh, uh, on top of some background, we have kind of uh, infinite number of uh, fields which look like a ghost. So uh, it's equivalent to a, a pair of uh, fields of two fields with complex masses is equivalent to uh, two, two mixed uh, real fields uh, where one of the fields is a ghost. So it's uh, some strange thing uh, for, for which we still don't know the correct interpretation. But uh, what we can achieve uh, is to require that uh, the classical solution at least is stable. Uh, and uh, the condition of stability of the classical solution, so the uh, on inflationary solution in this model, is actually uh, it can be traced uh, as a condition for these uh, complex masses appearing in this model. Uh, and uh, this means that imaginary part of this mass squared has to be smaller than uh, nine uh, Hubble scale squared multiplied by real part of uh, these masses and. Uh, we have shown that uh, tuning a non of non-local function used in this uh, propagator is required uh, to reach classically stable solution, but this is possible to achieve. It's a non-trivial mathematical task, but uh, it is possible to give explicit but quite complicated examples of non-local current factors which lead to stable uh, classical solutions without growing modes. Uh, another issue we considered in this model is uh, uh, the question whether uh, non-local uh, modification of uh, scalar field uh, leads to something uh, st uh, stable with respect to quantum correction, corrections. So we estimated the um, size of quantum corrections of this model. To uh, achieve this, we used uh, the uh, sim we did a simple study of uh, computing effective potential in uh, non-local scalar field theory. Uh, so we just computed logarithm of the determinant of second variation of the Lagrangian. Uh, and in non-local case, it uh, can be written in this way. Then uh, from Minkowski uh, integral to Euclidean, uh, we just use analytic continuation of this effect affection, uh, which means, uh, which is, uh, so in principle, uh, we can directly write the Euclidean integrals because uh, non uh, because um, effective potential doesn't have uh, any uh, external momenta, which uh, can be, uh, which has to be the argument of this value, of this function, but it's just an argument, uh, uh, function of scalar which is double prime of uh, the potential. That's why uh, we can just write down this integral or, uh, uh, in the Euclidean space and compute it. So it's some simple computation which can be done. And uh, uh, this is the result of this computation, uh, which can be obtained numerically. 
And then uh, in order to, uh, to see that the local limit of the theory corresponds to the familiar quadratic divergence, we need a kind of tuning of mass term in order to get the potential uh, in uh, infrared limit uh, to get a good infrared limit of the potential. And this can be achieved by tuning of the mass term uh, in such a way, uh, which actually uh, in the local limit goes to, uh, tends to normal renormalization procedure. Uh, and this condition eventually provides small correction to initial uh, potential of massless color field. Uh, also, we have, um, also we need to write down the correction m squared by squared uh, to the initial potential. So we should start from this kind of potential and uh, compute quantum correction to this potential and uh, uh, tune n0 in such a way that at small values we have uh, phi to the four potential without uh, large mass of uh, in order not to gain a huge mass of uh, uh, Higgs in the infrared. After that, uh, we obtain the loop, correct loop corrected potential, which is uh, very close to the original potential. Uh, but in this case, we need non-locality scale to be small, a bit smaller than uh, mass one over psi, which is quite natural to expect because uh, if we uh, had non-locality scale much larger, then we get uh, some larger size of quantum corrections. But for uh, smaller non-locality scale, we get uh, small quantum corrections, so smaller than unity, depending on uh, the values of lambda. And uh, this is the potential when uh, this correction is uh, sizable. It's written for it's uh, plotted for illustration, where lambda is taken to be larger than mass one over psi, and this is already leading to, to some uh, strong coupling uh, in this model, and it's not phenomenologically applicable. So uh, this is about healing of the Higgs potential because uh, it's, um, we got some theory which has small quantum corrections and at least this is uh, uh, computable in this model because in the original model of Higgs inflation exactly this uh, part of the potential cannot be even computed because uh, it's the model is non-renormalizable. Uh, here during inflation we can at least say that uh, we know that there is a shift symmetry which protects from large quantum corrections and here we have IR theory which we know uh, theory of Higgs inflation and what is in between and how to connect one to another, uh, it was shown that it's really not possible to do uh, in the original Higgs inflation model. In the model with non-local propagator, we can uh, at least uh, make this computation. So, uh, as I told uh, in the beginning, there is, there is a list of problems of Higgs inflation. And then let's check which of these problems uh, can be solved with non-local propagator. Uh, model becomes non-renormalizable at scales, minus Planck over psi, which is much smaller than the Planck scale. At the scale, uh, th this is solved. And because uh, the model we consider with non-local propagator is actually renormalizable. Uh, up to infinite energies. Of course, we don't consider gravity here, but uh, it's claimed uh, in many papers that uh, addition of non-local pro non local propagators for gravitons also can lead uh, to the normalizable gravity. But there are a lot of issues and this is very complicated model, which uh, can still uh, wait for further study. Uh, at the scale of uh, mass Planck over psi, uh, three level scatterings of standard model, uh, standard model by stones enter the strong coupling regime. Actually, in this model, uh, as shown in our paper, it's, uh, this problem can also be relaxed. And uh, uh, finally, we can get a weakly coupled theory 
the principal up, up to infinity energies. The projectivity of this model uh, is restored, uh, production of particles with high momenta, momenta higher than cutoff scale, uh, due to the fact that we push cutoff scale to infinity, or at least to Planck mass, because uh, this uh, scale uh, quantum gravity effect would be relevant. Production of particles uh, higher than cutoff scale uh, still, still can be studied. But it's a very difficult question because it requires it would require a very non-trivial model uh, to look how these particles will be produced. It's a, a quite complicated task for future study. Uh, it is possible now to connect IR parameters with UV ones, definitely, because we have only one set of... So once we fix uh, the non-local form factor, we can compute, in principle, we can compute uh, everything in this model. And as we have shown, uh, size of quantum corrections under certain conditions uh, is small. So the theory looks like, uh, behaves like a perturbative theory. So uh, IR and UV parameters can be uh, computed definitely. Uh, the last problem with the central values of top quark mass, uh, and the metastability of Higgs potential. Uh, this here I put uh, the question because it's not yet started and uh, how um, the run of uh, stand, uh, standard model Higgs self-coupling changes in the presence of non-local propagator, uh, it is not yet started. And it's, it's also a good question. So, there is a list of open problems. Uh, uh, study of reheating after uh, inflation in such a model, connection to uh, exact connections to inflationary observables, such as uh, more exact values of scalar to tensor ratio and non Gaussianities, estimations of non Gaussianities, uh, behavior of loop amplitudes, large momenta, uh, depending on uh, form factors effective potential of real Higgs, uh, with, uh, which is coupled to a lot of standard model stuff, uh, due to which, due to which uh, we have running of lambda and uh, loop contributions to, uh, especially fermion loop contributions to effective Higgs potential. And uh, the, the, one of the issues is the nature of complex poles in the propagator on top of the background, and uh, there are controls controversial opinions on whether it makes theory bad or not, uh, or it can be solved. And uh, in the case if uh, uh, the model is classically stable, it still can be considered uh, once it has a one good vacuum. Uh, then fine tuning for six months, uh, which actually reappears as uh, contribution to the Higgs mass of order of uh, non locality scale squared, which can be uh, renormalized, of course, by means no. of fine, fine Sorry, fine but fine. your time is finished. Okay, I'm finished already. Ah, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, also there are connections to quantum gravity and string theory. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any question. Just the short, <clears throat> stupid question. Is there any hope that uh, the process of choice, choice uh, of uh, non-local Lagrangian will uh, converge to something simple? Uh, this is a difficult question, at least in models which are considered now, it doesn't seem that it can be written as something simple. At least if we require uh, the absence of um, growing modes on top of inflation. Uh, and this is uh, this this works both for Higgs inflation mm -hmm. with non-local propagator and for Starobinsky inflation, for non-local Starobinsky inflation. Uh, the requirement that we don't have growing modes on top of the sitter uh, leads to anyway rules out uh, some kind of exponent exponents of box, uh, but still uh, 
the, the functions which satisfy this kind of complicated conditions for its roots on top of some background, uh, the, they look like this quite complicated. Okay. Maybe there could be written some another approach, uh, maybe exploiting some symmetries, which uh, leads to the fact that we would not have uh, such instabilities on top of any good background. But it's a different, it, it will be a different approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the <coughs> interesting talk again. And we, <coughs> we go to the next speaker, uh, David Kubizniak. Uh, yeah, you have to stop your sharing, sharing the screen. Okay. So we can see you, David. Hello. That's good. Okay. So you can start soon. Yeah? Oh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me as well? Yes. Uh, yes, perfect. <laughs> well, hi everybody and thank you so much to the organizers who invited me to talk here. So I'm going to tell you about a question. Is there a gauss bonnet gravity in four dimensions? Um, and so let me start with uh, the famous Lovelock's theorem. And basically it goes back to, 90, uh, to 71 and it says, well, in four dimensions, the Einstein-Hilbert action is the only local action apart from the cosmological constant and topological terms that leads to the second order differential equations for the metric. So in other words, in four dimensions, the Einstein's theory is the only theory which we have in four dimensions, which can be derived from the local action. Yet, uh, there appeared a paper about two years ago now that actually basically questions this and presents another theory of gravity in four dimensions. Um, and so, the, the aim of this talk is to actually make sense uh, of the statement and show that maybe the statement is not entirely correct, but, but that can be uh, a little bit amended. So here's the uh, plan of the talk. So I'll explain what the gauss bonnet gravity is. Um, and then I'll explain the original proposal by Glavon and Lynn, you know, what they did. And I will show that this proposal actually has a couple of problems, um, but, but then I will show you how to actually amend it and how you can get some consistent theory in four dimensions. Um, but we shall see that the theory is a little bit more complicated than originally expected. So now my talk is based on two papers. Uh, one is mine, mine is not mine. The papers basically appeared uh, very shortly one after another. Unfortunately, we were the second ones. But anyway, so, so it's basically you know how to correct the theory in four dimensions. And so these are the people who scooped us a couple of days. Um, all right, so what is the Gauss-Bonnet gravity? Um, so we, want, we all know that if you want to write down the gravitational action, we want a scalar Lagrangian to preserve the diffeomorphism invariance. And of course, we want at most second order equations of, of motion for the metric. Um, otherwise, you have runaway solutions and other problems. So everything I do here is just classical, OK? So, um, and of course, you know, one possibility to write down is the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is given over here. And then the question is, is this just the simplest choice or can we add um, other scalars? For example, like Ricci square and, and, and Ricci scale square and the Riemann square and so on. And as I already you know, mentioned this um, Lovelock theorem in 4D, this is not possible. So in 4D, the Einstein-Hilbert action is the only one which gives you second order equations of motion. However, in higher D, we can have additional theories. Uh, and so this leads to gauss bonnet gravity or more generally to Lovelock uh, gravity. So what is gauss bonnet gravity? So basically I just add the following invariant where you see there's a Riemann square and Ricci square and the Ricci scale square, but, but the coefficients in front of the terms are fine tuned. So I have one minus four and plus one. And if you fine tune them, then you actually get second order equations of motion. So interestingly, if you look at this, you know, fine tune uh, scale invariant, what you find that in four dimensions, this is just topological, it's just a total derivative. If you go to uh, lower dimensions, it identically vanishes. 
So it only becomes interesting in five dimensions and higher. And you know the corresponding equations of motion, if you vary this with respect to the metric, give you, you know, such contribution to the Einstein equations. And obviously, you know, these equations are second order. So, so everything here it doesn't contain any derivatives of the Riemann tensor and stuff like that. So it just gives you second order uh, equations of motion. But this is non-trivial only in five dimensions and higher. So more generally, you have these slow low gravities which are unique higher curvature gravities that yield uh, second order PDEs for the metric. And, and they have the following general structure. Uh, so your Lagrangian, so alpha K are just coupling constants and the L LK are the Euler densities. And basically they are anti-symmetrized contractions of various number of Riemann tensors. And you go to, uh, and so this sum is only non-trivial if you go to, so if you are in D dimensions, then you can go on into k given by the whole part d minus one over two. So just to you know get you familiar with what these things mean. So of course, if I take k equal to zero, there is no Riemann tensor, and so there'll be just a constant. So the first, well, the zero term is just a cosmological constant. K equal to one, there is one Riemann tensor, but but antisymmetrized properly. So that gives you the Ricci scalar. And then k equal to two gives you Gauss Bonnet term and so on, a uh, high order level of theories. So what is interesting is that as you go with these oil densities higher and higher, um, they become to, uh, they are topological in dimensions which are smaller than something. So for example, the Ricci scale is topological in two dimensions and only non-trivial in three. Uh, gauss bonnet term is topological in four dimensions and only non-trivial in five, and so on. So anyway, so some people consider this level of gravity as natural generalization of Einstein theory um, in uh, two higher dimensions. All right, so what we were trying to do is that we were trying to take this gauss bonnet term in higher dimensions and basically take the limit to four dimensions and produce a non-trivial theory. All right, so here is the proposal by Glavin Lin and, and the physical review letters paper. And so let me just highlight what they say is that well, we present the general covariant modified theory of gravity in D equal to four dimensions. And they say they propagate only the massless graviton. And then they talk about how they actually obtain it. So they basically rescale some, uh, somehow the gauss bonnet coupling constant. And, and then they say, uh, you know, this singular limit gives rise to non-trivial contributions to gravitational dynamics while preserving the number of graviton degrees of freedom and being free from Ostrogatsky instability. So that's the claim in the PRL paper. Of course, we should never trust PRL papers. Not all of them are correct. So, so more, more, you know, more concretely, what they do is that they start with the einstein hilbert gauss bonnet action in D dimensions. Sorry, I switched, switched from small d to capital D here. Uh, should be the same thing. So you have, you have uh, alpha is the coupling constant to gauss bonnet term. And then basically what they do is that they consider enhanced symmetry solutions, for example, like maximally symmetric space or spherical black holes or FRW space time. Um, and then they look at the very, you know, the relevant equations, and then they want to take the limit of these equations or of the solutions to four dimensions, if you want. And then they realize is that, uh, okay, if you, if you just send, you know, D goes to four, you, you get nothing. But at the same time, you rescale the coupling alpha. So basically you go from alpha to new alpha divided by D minus four, which basically means like I'm sending the original alpha to infinity. Then you get some non-trivial uh, contributions from the gauss bonnet term to your solutions. So let me demonstrate this on the black hole solutions, which, so, so if you write down the, the, the gauss, -Bonnet, uh, gauss bonnet spherical black hole solutions, then this is the metric and this is the corresponding uh, metric function F. You notice that the spherical solution is simply characterized by one metric function F and one over F. So it's, so it's almost like Schwarzschild. Um, and so then you want to take the limit d goes to four, but of course, let's say I look at this term here and I'm sending d goes to four, then I'm dividing by zero because I don't want to do that. But if, if at the same time, I set d minus four times alpha to new alpha. So this will be just new alpha. And then I take the limit d goes to four, then this is finite. Uh, this is new alpha and that the rest is finite. This is new alpha and, and the rest is finite. So then you get a beautiful solution. Well, solution, uh, uh, at least you get a beautiful four dimensional metric, which looks like this. And so you will say, this is the, the solution of my 40 Gauss-Bonnet gravity. Um, okay, 
And of course, this will be a black hole solution if there's a minus sign here. So now this, of course, has a couple of problems. Um, and you know, the main question is, is the limit well defined? Um, and so it's immediately uh, written in the abstract of this paper, no. And then they explain why. Um, and the reason uh, why this is not uh, really well defined limit is that, okay, I you take the Einstein Hilbert Kauss theory, you write down the corresponding equations of motion. And then, you know, so the, the, these are these parts. And so, so this is the correction, which comes from the Gauss Bonnet part. And interestingly, this correction splits into two parts. So it splits into the, this part L and it splits into the part S. So now what happens is that the part S has a very nice and smooth limit when you send D goes to four. However, L mu nu does not have a nice limit. So basically L mu nu is non-trivial in D not equal to four and it's identically zero in D equal to four. So in D equal to four, you have zero divided by zero limit. And of course this is not um, you know, well defined. So now you know, what people thought is that, well, what if we throw away this term here and just consider you know, this, this part over here, but then uh, this is great. But the problem is with this is that the Bianchi identity for, uh, fails. So, so S mu no longer satisfies Nabla mu S mu equal to zero. What it means is that you're basically losing the filmorphism invariance. Um, all right. So, so then another problem, which you know was formulated from a completely different point of view, what people realized in this paper is that they looked at those uh, um, graviton scattering amplitudes, um, and so then they confirmed that you know in four D there are no any other uh, than GR three level graviton scattering amplitudes. And then when they looked at the high dimensional gauss bonnet scattering amplitudes, um, they, they show that if you take the limit of these, you obtain a state, certain scalar tensor theory. So no longer you just have a graviton, but, but you have also scalar propagating there. There were many other inconsistencies found with uh, Ravon and Lin's proposal um, over here. So, 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 so then the question is, is there a gauss bonnet gravity in four dimensions? So certainly not in the original proposal, but maybe you can do something more. So, so this is what we did. Um, and so what we, what we did is was basically based on a very old paper by Mann and Ross uh, from 93. And so what they were trying to recover is that if you can make sense of a general relativity in two dimensions, and so, so you know, this is this would be the Einstein-Hilbert term. But of course, the if you remember from the picture I showed you about log-log theories, then the Ricci scale is actually topological in, in two dimensions. So this is just a total derivative and doesn't give you any any dynamics. So, so what these two gentlemen proposed is some kind of you know very clever regularization scheme. So what they do is that they take the you know they, they write down this metric uh, this action in d dimensions. And then they rescale, they, they write it for a conformal rescale metric. So instead of writing it for G, it, it just introduced some kind of scalar here, Psi. Uh, so you conformal rescale the metric. Um, and so, so you expand this thing here. Of course, you just you know, open vault and you see how the conformal rescaling gives you the new Ricci scale and so on. But then what the crucial step is that uh, you expand this around two dimensions. So you expand for small epsilon. Uh, and you rescale the coupling exactly as uh, as Glavan and Lin basically proposed. You are sending the original coupling, the Newton's uh, the Newton's coupling kappa, to infinity, so uh, and uh, so that it gives you know the product d minus two times kappa gives you a new kappa, and then you take the new limit, right? So so now what you what you discover is that there is like a divergent topological term, which you can kill by a counter term over here. Of course, this counter term is nothing else than the original uh, metric, if you want. And so it's topological in two dimensions. So it doesn't really you know, change the theory in two dimensions. It would change the theory in higher dimensions. But you are taking the limit to, to two dimensions. And so this thing here, if you subtract this counter term, gives you a finite limit. And if you look at the finite limit, so you, you do the mass, you obtain this theory over here. So there's a scalar multiplying the Ricci scalar and the kinetic for the scalar. In other words, this is basically a scalar tensor theory, which is known as JT gravity and you know, much celebrated in these days because of the black hole information paradox. So interestingly, this theory has basically the same black hole solution as the four dimensional theory if you take the limit 
to, to two dimensions. So basically, you get something like care solution in two dimensions. And you know, this has been, for example, studied in this paper over here. All right, so, so that was the idea. So we just took the same, same idea and, and, and went to four dimensions and to the Gauss Bonnet term. And so we, we take the conformability scale metric, write down the Gauss Bonnet term for the conformability scale metric, subtract this counter term over here, expand it around four dimensions, rescale the coupling, and take the limit d goes to four dimensions. And after some field redefinition, you get this theory over here. Okay, so, so if you look at this theory over here, this is written here again. So, so this is just a, the standard Einstein Hilbert part. Uh, but, but then you get something which is proportional to this gauss bonnet coupling. But, but then the first term is just the scalar field times the gauss bonnet coupling, which people typically consider. Um, and then you have another term, which is a weird kinetic term for the, for the uh, scalar field phi. Here, the couple, capital GAB is the Einstein tensor. And then you get even weirder kinetic terms for the scalar field over here. So now what is very interesting is that if you if you are familiar with the Horneski theory, then this is a particular case of Horneski theory. So it's a particular case of a theory, which is the most general theory, which, which uh, scale tensor theory, which, which leads to second order equations of motion, both for scale and for the metric. Um, interestingly, the same theory can be uh, derived by a completely different procedure uh, known as Kalsa Klein compactification. And this was done in, in this paper over here. And this is a very weird causal Klein compactification because basically what you do is that you start in B dimensions. Um, you want to end up in four dimensions uh, and you compactify on D minus four dimensional space, which you assume uh, to be uh, maximally symmetric. So for example, flat space. Uh, but, but in the end, so you do this, you write down the action for this, but then you take the limit D goes to four. So basically, this is a causal Klein compactification where your compactified space uh, has zero dimensions. Anyway, so it leads to this theory over here. That, uh, and you know, it's still unclear why this gives rise to exactly the same theory through the conformal rescaling or through this thing here. Um, okay, so let's discuss some solutions of this theory. So you can look at the static symmetric solutions. Uh, and of course, in general, if you have scalar fields and so on, you will have two metric functions. So I parameterize FH and, and F here. But, but then if you concentrate on the on the Schwarzschild case, H equal to one, then you find that the solution is given over here, the scale, scale field is given here, and the metric function is, uh, is, is here. So if you remember what I showed you before, this is precisely the metric which you get by the naive limit d goes to four of the gauss bonnet solution. Okay. So now what is, what is very interesting is that, of course, I have, choosing, I have been choosing h equal to one here, um, and that's, that doesn't seem very general. But what was shown very, very recently by Fernandez et al. is that basically this is the unique solution, which is, which, which, which is a stable one. So, so, you know, that doesn't help you to consider time-dependent scale of fields and stuff like that. All the other solutions are basically uh, not, not solutions. Okay. Um, so what is even more interesting is that the same space-time was written down something like 50 years ago by Tomoz Ava, and so he reminded that in this paper over here. And it was written like a quantum gravity corrected metric, and it was also considered in these papers. Um, so you have now theory, which is our the scale tensor theory of the Harnesky type. You can calculate, for example, the entropy of these solutions. And what you find out is that uh, the entropy has, a, has logarithmic corrections. So you know, it reminds you quantum gravity, but of course here it's just a classical solution of our new theory of, of you know, scale tensor theory of gravity. Uh, people have devoted lots of time to observational features of this solution. They studied lie bending, black hole shadows, the creation disk and so on. Um, all right. Um, so maybe I have a little bit more time, but it doesn't matter. So, so let me just you know, summarize what, what this theory is here. So, so you know, recently there has been lots of interest um, in 4D Gauss Bonnet gravity. Um, so what turns out is that the original proposal, which was, was done by Glavan and Lin of taking the naive limit of the solutions um, uh, of D-dimensional Gauss Bonnet gravity uh, upon the rescaling the, the coupling constants like that does not really does not really work. It's not unique. Uh, it, you know, it has problems. Um, yeah, it simply does not work. 
However, you can make sense of this limit uh, in two alternative scenarios. So one is this Kalsa Klein compactification, uh, which I haven't really mentioned, but, but you can look at the paper. Um, and then the other one is the conformal trick, which where you rescale the metric and you subtract the counter time and take the limit. And interestingly, both these two kind of completely different approaches converge on the same theory, which is the theory over here. So, so interestingly, you know, this theory, of course, is meaningful, not only in four dimensions, but, but in lower dimensions as well. So in principle, you can write down Gauss Bonnet theory in three dimensions or even in two dimensions. Of course, you know, sometimes will identically vanish. So for example, if I'm in three dimensions, the, this term will vanish and so on. Um, anyway, so there have been lots of generalizations of this theory to, to, to supergravity and other, uh, other theories, which is, for example, here. Um, the theory is nice in the sense is that it's derived from a more fundamental theory. Uh, so it has nicer solutions than, for example, the standard einstein dilaton gauss bonnet theory or other Horneski theories, uh, which you know can be written analytically down and so on. Um, so this is the black hole solution, which is quite interesting. And it's interesting from both theoretical and observational aspects. So you have you know, logarithmic corrections to entropy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some discussion about removal of singularities. Um, and you know, there, are, uh, there have been lots of discussion of observational predictions. So now what is not clear at this point is whether the theory is well posed and you know, how many really propagating degrees of freedom it has. So naively you have scale and you have tensor, while the scalar does not make it to infinity. So people show that. So, so the asymptotic infinity does not contain any scale waves and, uh, or anything like that. But you know that doesn't mean that you don't have propagating degree of freedom. Um, so the other alternative, if, if how you can get to four dimensions, is that you you give up you know diffeomorphism invariance, um, and then uh, you can get you know you can take the limit of the tensor SQU. Um, but, but but then you know people don't want really uh, giving up diffeomorphism invariance. So let me stop here. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, I don't see any query. I just have a question. Uh, so the answer finally is is no. See, because you you find the combination of two known series here, Gauss Bonnet multiplied by scalar and part of Harndesky. Both of them are known. So finally, you you find interesting connection between the these two, of course. But. Yeah. Not, uh, the new, not the new Lagrangian, yes? No, it's not a new, uh, certainly yeah. I agree. It's not a new Lagrangian. It's just a very specific choice of the Hordnesky type theory, right? Um, and so you can identify you know, which, you know, what you need to do to, 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 to get this out of Hordnesky. But what is, I would say that this theory is sort of singled out in the sense that it has nice solutions. Um, mm. yeah. yeah, and the such manipulations by parameters is, is really interesting. If you remember, the care solution was also derived by some manipulation of simple manipulations, but then already derived. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. So we pass to the next talk. Yeah. Uh, Francesca, Sarah, yes? Are you here? Here I am. Okay. So. Um, I will share. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, right. <clears throat> and can you hear me well? Very well. Okay. You so, can start, yes. uh, first of all, thank you for uh, for having me here uh, presenting, and uh, thanks uh, for the very interesting uh, conference. And well, uh, what uh, what I'm going to tell you about. Uh, is uh, how uh, modification of uh, general relativity involving the, the addition of a shift symmetric uh, scalar can affect uh, black holes. And in particular, I will focus on whether or not there are uh, shift symmetric theories in which a, a, black, a static black hole can be surrounded by a scalar uh, non-trivial scalar configuration. And first of all, let me mention uh, what is the reason to be interested uh, in a static uh, black hole. And a reason uh, is uh, coming from the 
observation of gravitational waves uh, from black hole mergers, because uh, at the end of these uh, detections, uh, well, the, the, the radiation ends uh, with the so-called ring down, in which uh, uh, the black hole, the remnant, uh, is uh, radiating away its anisotropies. And in this last spec uh, of radiation, um, we find uh, an, interesting, uh, an interesting fact, uh, and which is that uh, we can describe it by means of uh, perturbation of the stationary black hole that uh, will be left after the, after the merger. So this, uh, in this way, this uh, ring down radiation, which uh, comes from an event which is very dynamical, is uh, giving us information about uh, a, stationary, a stationary background solution of the black hole. And OK, so um, in the last uh, 50 years, uh, what the community learned uh, about uh, stationary black holes is that they are very, very simple. And indeed, uh, there are the so-called uh, Noher theorems, which state that uh, in uh, several uh, uh, theories, you cannot uh, characterize a black hole with uh, further parameters besides the mass, the electric charge, and the angular momentum. And uh, when there might be uh, further quantities that characterize a black hole, the black hole is said to have uh, hair because uh, it's a sort of uh, black hole equivalent of uh, an unconventional uh, haircut to have uh, another quantity besides these three. And so uh, one can study this uh, question of whether or not there are hair in shift symmetric theories. And this will most uh, often correspond to the fact of, uh, well, to the question of whether or not the scalar field has a non-trivial conf uh, configuration around the black hole. And uh, okay, uh, you you all know very well what is uh, Ordensky theories and DOST. And uh, let me just say that uh, uh, the the shift focusing on on shift symmetry can be. Uh, interesting uh, uh, because uh, you, you restrict uh, to theories in which uh, the scalar is nat naturally massless or, or very, very light. And this can be uh, desirable if uh, one wants to describe also cosmological effects besides astrophysical ones. And, uh, and okay, uh, around 10 years ago, there was uh, a, um, a result in this, uh, in this setting a no hair theorem, uh, which uh, assuming uh, spherical symmetry static uh, configuration for both uh, the metric and the, and the scalar field, then uh, asymptotic uh, behaviors of both uh, metric and scalar, and then uh, also assuming uh, um, that the Lagrangian of the scalar field had a kinetic term and uh, led to second order equations of motion. Starting from this set of assumption, uh, it is possible to uh, prove that uh, the configuration of the scalar, the only allowed configuration is phi prime equals zero, so a, a trivial configuration. And these, uh, uh, well, um, the key facts are that uh, the, the current has only a radial component and this radial component is uh, uh, proportional to the first derivative of the scalar. Then, uh, the key uh, requirement is uh, to ask that the, the scalar given by the contraction with itself of the shift symmetry current is uh, finite. And this requirement, uh, well, it's not, uh, not only a requirement of absence of uh, singularities of the space time, but uh, more a requirement related to the EFT nature of uh, uh, GR and uh, modified uh, um, modified gravity. Because uh, if you add uh, a scalar quantity, a scalar operator, uh, it can always uh, appear uh, in, the, in the effective action because uh, it is generated by quantum correction, unless a symmetry uh, forbids it. So if you add a, a divergent scalar, it could uh, appear with a very tiny coefficient in your effective action, but it would still be divergent. And therefore, your solutions would be uh, are reliable and uh, unpredictable. So by asking this, uh, then it's, 
it's uh, straightforward enough to show that uh, the current has to vanish identically. And therefore, because of this uh, proportionality, also the scalar field must be in a trivial configuration. And this argument actually can be extended to uh, theories with the uh, higher order equations of motion. For instance, the DOST theories that are connected to Ardensky through uh, this formal uh, redefinition, this formal plus conformal redefinition of the metric. And in this case, uh, one can uh, uh, carry out uh, all the steps of the proof uh, by Nicolis and Hui and uh, get to the same result as long as uh, the derivatives of the scalar vanish at infinity. And okay, so we have in this uh, setup of shift symmetric theories, this uh, strong statement about uh, uh, air. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it was uh, understood in the years that uh, there can be exceptions. When one chooses, uh, Appropriate, appropriately uh, the functions that appear in the Ordensky Lagrangian. For instance, uh, taking uh, square root of x or log x, where this x is the kinetic term of the scalar field, basically, or even taking uh, non-integer powers can lead to, um, uh, to a shift symmetry current, which is no more, no longer uh, proportional to the first derivative of the field of the scalar field. And basically, if one insists in writing uh, the current as proportional to the scalar field, this uh, proportionality function f that I write here will not, uh, will not be regular in the limit in which uh, phi prime goes to zero. And so uh, this, uh, this irregularity actually spreads to a lot of other quantities. And uh, almost all of these uh, theories can be found to be uh, patholo pathological around uh, x equals zero and around uh, the Lorentz invariant vacuum. Because uh, there are always uh, perturbations for which uh, the computations are impossible to carry out because there are uh, coefficients that are infinite. And so, um, we are left with only an exception to these exceptions, which is the, the so-called linear scalar gauss bonnet coupling, which corresponds to one of those choices uh, of uh, quinti kordensky equal to logarithm of x. And uh, actually, it can be proven that uh, uh, in this, uh, with, the, with this choice, the, the quinti kordensky lagrangian is equal up to total derivatives to phi times the gauss bonnet invariant, which uh, by now we, we all know, <laughs> thanks to David, uh, what, uh, what it is. And, um, and this gauss bonnet invariant is also a total derivative. So uh, this operator is also shift symmetric. And, uh, and okay, almost okay, actually, because uh, uh, it was found uh, by looking at this uh, Hayley solution that uh, the, 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 the square of the shift symmetry current for these uh, uh, choice of theories was divergent uh, at the horizon of the vehicle. So uh, it was puzzling. But uh, actually, the solution of this puzzle is that uh, this, uh, this um, shift symmetry current in the case of uh, scalar Gauss Bonnet is not uh, a covariant uh, vector because uh, Gauss Bonnet is the total derivative of an object which is not covariant. And so when we, when we contract uh, and try to take the square, uh, we do not obtain a scalar quantity. And indeed, we can verify that this, uh, this, this uh, square of the current, uh, the value depends on the, um, on the coordinates uh, that are used. And the divergence can also be uh, tamed by choosing uh, an appropriate coordinate system. But actually, this, this divergence means nothing because uh, this is not a scalar quantity and can never appear in an effective action. So we, are, uh, uh, are, are, we arrive to the conclusion that this theory is healthy and we are happy. And uh, what we can do at this point is uh, to consider what is the simplest, uh, um, the simplest theory in involving this operator, phi times gauss bonnet that uh, uh, can affect black holes that are in the range of observation of LIGO and Virgo. 
And uh, okay, one could say, well, the simplest theory is for sure Einstein Hilbert plus kinetic term plus phi times Gauss Bonnet. Uh, simpler than that, uh, you cannot get. But uh, we all know that uh, as, as GR, this uh, modification of GR is an effective field theory. So we have to make sure that uh, when we compute uh, a, a quantity using uh, these uh, three operators that I mentioned, the quantum corrections are uh, uh, actually uh, negligible and do not affect uh, the computations that we are carrying out. So for instance, we can consider this uh, d phi to the fourth and, uh, and we can compute uh, its uh, loop induced value. So in order to do that, uh, we consider the leading operators in uh, terms of one over M Planck that uh, appear from these uh, interactions. Uh, so we have uh, the minimal coupling and then we have this other operator arising from phi times gauss bonnet And uh, notice that this uh, will, uh, um, will cause a new uh, strong coupling scale to appear in our theory, which is much lower than M Planck. So in any case, our effective uh, field theory uh, will break at scales much lower than, uh, than what GR does. But anyway, we can carry out uh, our computation and we find that the loop, uh, um, that the loop uh, induced value of this uh, d phi to the fourth is uh, uh, a coefficient one over n Planck to the fourth. And now we can consider the equations of motion in terms of just uh, the three operators, uh, the scalar gauss bonnet and the kinetic terms. And, uh, and see if uh, the phi to the fourth over and Planck to the fourth is tiny or is large. And we find uh, plugging uh, the numbers that uh, uh, are the most uh, convenient uh, for, uh, for uh, an observation of uh, effects on black holes, we find that, that these uh, corrections are uh, very, very small. And so they are negligible. However, we can still uh, question further uh, this, uh, this theory because uh, we are saying uh, uh, that there is a very large separation between two operators, this uh, uh, d square phi uh, dh dh, so the operators that, uh, are, uh, that are inside uh, phi Gauss Bonnet and the operator d phi to the fourth. And what we can say, uh, what, what we can ask is uh, whether or not it's uh, there, there will be a UV completion that when we integrate out the UV degrees of freedom leads to uh, this theory with this large separation. So in order to answer this question, uh, we can think of uh, having a, a bona fide, let's say UV completion, which is a unitary, which has Lorentz invariance, uh, which, is, which has a polynomial boundedness of amplitudes, uh, analyticity and crossing symmetry. And in this setup, we can derive uh, a so-called beyond positivity bound, considering scattering amplitude gen in, in this theory that we, are, uh, that we are using in flat space time of uh, two scalars that go in two scalars and uh, the dispersion relation of this scattering amplitude. So this dispersion relation will involve a sum over cross sections of products uh, of uh, scattering of two scalars, okay? And, uh, and these cross sections, we can just uh, uh, compute a, a bound that is called beyond positivity by including just some of these uh, cross sections. For instance, just the one of two scalars that go in two gravitons with an interaction, which is uh, the one sourced by the phi gauss bonnet operator. And doing this, uh, we find that indeed, we cannot uh, set the, the size of um, this d phi to the fourth uh, to uh, an arbitrarily small value. And this is uh, what we can read in this, uh, in this uh, inequality, which will depend also on the UV cutoff at which our EFT stops working. But, uh, but okay, in general, this, this means that uh, d phi to the fourth must appear with a coefficient much, much larger than the one that is induced by, by loops. And uh, even more, if we, if we ask that, uh, that this uh, EFT that we are writing of Gauss-Bonnet uh, coupled to the scalar 
is uh, valid up to the scales that are probed, for instance, uh, with the tabletop experiment, so up to the inverse micron, then uh, we find that, uh, that this lambda x will have uh, a value small enough to make uh, d phi to the fourth over lambda, lambda x to the fourth of order one over the, on the solutions around the black holes. So what we, what we are finding out is that uh, uh, in this, uh, if there is this UV completion, the, there cannot, uh, I mean, we cannot neglect uh, d phi to the fourth over lambda x to the fourth. And this, uh, and okay, so uh, the two points that, that I hope uh, I was uh, uh, able to convey to you are that uh, scalar gauss bonnet is a key for uh, having uh, hair in shift symmetric theories, and then that uh, we can uh, use uh, EFT considerations and uh, amplitude oriented considerations in order to obtain uh, strong constraints on the theories uh, that describe uh, even black holes. And uh, so, uh, so that's it. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Now questions. Yeah, there is one. Uh, Zakaria, please. Thank you very much for my talk. I just have a question about, uh, because you said that uh, the scalar goes on it, uh, gravity is the case loss, but it's just the, um, the subclass of Rodensky. So, and you motivated to go beyond Helmansky. So I wanted to know, because you said shift symmetry uh, allow us to have uh, a massless scalar field for, for example, for late time cosmology. Uh, mm -hmm. But we know from GW1717 that uh, scalar goes on gravity is not uh, really viable. So how you can uh, interpret the same scalar field, which is uh, which represents the hair here as the one for cosmic acceleration? Like, do you need to add these extra terms beyond Havansky? So what is the motivation to go beyond? Because if we keep only scalar goes on gravity, uh, just when we want to interpret it, on the cosmological scales, it would be not viable according to GW170817. Mm -hmm. So yeah, still uh, you have to, to add these operators if you want uh, them, uh, if you want the scalar gas one to be relevant for uh, LIGO Virgo observations. That's uh, my point. So you mean that your extra operators are from like from beyond, when you said beyond Hersky, are they are from GLPV or like we need to go to those to have these extra operators? No, no, I'm saying uh, d phi to the fourth, which is uh, not P of X. Uh, are you talking about uh, other uh, extra operators? I don't, uh... Yeah, uh, just want to know from which you take your operators, not from the EFT point of view, but from which class? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking. Uh, about Ordensky, possibly about uh, about uh, also theories that are obtained with invertible uh, confidence formal uh, transformations. Okay. Yeah, because when you do this formal transformation, you go to those. Yes. No, but actually uh, there is a there is a point uh, which I didn't mention, and it is that uh, when you do these transformations, Gauss Bonnet uh, stays. Uh, around, you cannot uh, change it to something else. You will okay, add yes, so you, you mean that the presence of this term will guarantee the presence of the hair? Yes. Hmm. Okay, okay. At least in this uh, very uh, simple case of a static uh, scalar and a scalar that goes to zero at infinity. Okay, okay, thank you. And how you will detect uh, the presence of the cosmic scalar field by QNMs? No, that uh, that I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. This is uh, more uh, centered uh, on uh, the black hole. Uh. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. We have to stop now and pass to the next speaker. Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Uh, now, the <clears throat> last speaker for today is Ramin Jervaya. Are you here? Hello. Can, can you any, 
can you hear me? Uh, you, we can hear you, but not very loudly. Uh, okay. Ah, uh, now, no, it's okay hear? now. Ah, okay, nice. So I start sharing my screen. Sharing, yes. Uh, which, uh, uh, okay. Mm. Uh, do you see my, my screen now? Yes, very nice. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna start my, my talk. Uh, so today I'm gonna tell you about uh, asymptotically flat hairy black holes in a massive big gravity. Uh, so this uh, presentation is based on a, a publication with uh, my uh, PhD supervisor, Mikhail Volkov. Uh, so first, let me start with uh, an introduction of the massive big gravity theory. So the, <clears throat> the theory was introduced by Hassan and Rosen in uh, 2012. Uh, it is defined on a four dimensional manifold uh, equipped with two dynamical, uh, with two, yes, dynamical metrics. One is called the physical metric, G mu nu, while the other one is called the reference metric, F mu nu. And uh, then the action is constructed as follows. So first we have an Einstein Hilbert term for the first metric. So here R of G is a Ricci scalar computed from uh, G mu nu. K pa G is a um, coupling constant. Uh, then we have uh, another Einstein bar term for the second metric in red and then we have an interacting term uh, with uh, an inter uh, potential uh, which which depends on uh, roughly speaking uh, gamma which is the contractions in some sense of uh, the two metrics and m is a mass parameter of course very important because it's uh, um, a massive variety theory uh, kappa is just uh, the sum of the two other gravitational couplings and finally, we can add a matter term, but uh, we choose to only couple it to uh, one of the two metric. Here, uh, it's uh, G mu nu, and therefore, uh, physical matter does not see F mu nu. And this is why we call G mu nu the physical metric. So the theory uh, describes uh, interacting massless and massive gravitons. The, uh, the interacting potential uh, contains five constants BK, and uh, there are also scalar invariants of the of the tensor gamma, so it has the it's a special constructions to to make the, the theory ghost free. And finally, if we are in a vacuum, then we have an interchange symmetry. If we uh, interchange the two metrics, the two gravitational couplings, and the five constant uh, BK. So if we vary the action, we obtain the modified Einstein equations. So in the vacuum, the left-hand sides are just uh, Einstein tensors, and the right-hand sides are uh, effective stress, stress energy tensor coming from the interaction term. So they depend on, uh, on gamma. And we uh, recover the mass parameter M, and uh, kappa 1 and kappa 2 are just uh, rescaling of the original gravitational uh, couplings such that kappa 1 plus kappa 2 is equal to 1. Now, if we want to have flat space-time as a solution, and if we also want the m to be the first polymass of graviton, then we can, uh, the, there are only two independent parameters which can be constructed from the original BK. So uh, these two independent parameters are C2 and C4. Then we introduce a mixing parameter by um, kappa one equal to cosine square of eta and kappa two equal to sine square of eta. Uh, and uh, so uh, at the end of the day, we have uh, four independent parameter in our series. So now I will uh, talk, uh, I will focus on the um, static black holes in uh, massive big gravity. And first, just a few words about the obtentions of the ordinary differential equations. So we focus on the spherically symmetric uh, uh, case. So we introduce uh, Schwarzschild-like coordinates, okay. And for the metric, we make the assumptions of staticity, spherical symmetry, and bidiagonality. Then the line elements are as follows. Uh, so it's a very standard form. Uh, they are uh, five function of R, big Q, N, little Q, Y, 
and uh, u. And the function u has the interpretations as a, a, of a radial coordinate for the f metric, but we work with the r coordinate, so for us, u is a function of r. <clears throat> if we inject this, uh, this line elements to the field equations, we get a set of three coupled ODEs for n, y, and u. Uh, and uh, the big Q and the little Q can be obtained afterwards. So now a little bit historic about the black hole solutions in massive uh, big gravity. So first, um, a very important uh, thing is that uh, if one of the metric have an event horizon, then the other metric must share the same event horizon. This was shown by Defaye and Jacobson. Then some, uh, some time later, uh, Vol Michael Volkov and uh, separately Hassan et al mm, found that uh, Schwarzschild anti de Sitter metrics are uh, solutions uh, of uh, massive big gravity uh, with an effective cosmological constant which depends on the theory parameters. And in particular, the case lambda equal to zero, so the Schwarzschild solutions, is always, uh, is always solutions uh, for any values of the theory parameters. Uh, then Brito et al. and separately Babichev and Fabry found an instability of the Schwarzschild solutions. And some time later, Brito et al. again found numerically asymptotically flat hairy black holes uh, in massive big gravity. But uh, some years later, another group, Torcello et al. Uh, makes a conjecture that Schwarzschild is the only asymptotically flat solutions. And so a controversy has emerged and we have reanalyzed the issue uh, in our paper with, uh, with uh, Michael Volkov. Uh, so now here are our, our results about uh, these asymptotically flat uh, solutions. Um, just a few words about the, the numerical method and uh, some uh, technical details. Um, we have locally at horizon a uh, continuous set of solutions labeled by one parameter, which is uh, uh, equal to the value of u at rh, rh being the event horizon radius. So uh is just the event horizon radius measured by the second metric. And then uh, any black hole is uh, determined by the couple rh, uh, at horizon. But then if we numerically integrate the, the, integ the, the equation starting from this horizon, the solutions uh, generically asymptote to ADS space time or they exhibit a curvature singularity at finite r. So to impose the, the asymptotic flatness, uh, we have to look at the asymptotic behavior of the solutions. So we linearize the equations around flat uh, background and we obtain schematically the following uh, linear solutions. We have here in blue um, the massless contributions uh, with the, the ADM mass, which appear here. And in red, we have the massive contributions or the Yukawa, uh, the Yuka, which are like Yukawa term with exponentially growing and exponentially decaying mode. And the presence of this exponentially growing mode means that flat space time is not an attractor. And therefore, we have to impose c equal to zero from the very beginning, and then use a set a boundary conditions at a large r uh, by using these linear solutions as uh, an approximations for a large r, say, say uh, r star. So finally, so uh, as a result, we integrate the numeric the the, the equations in the finite range r h r star by using a multiple shooting algorithm and our three parameters uh, to be adjusted are the, the mass m, the integration, the integration constant b, and the value of uh. We expect, uh, of course, new solutions to emerge when uh, Schwarzschild become unstable, which happens for rh less than uh, 0 0.86. Uh, and I will call this very important value rgl, uh, for uh, Gregory Laflamme because the instability of Schwarzschild in uh, massive big gravity has the same structure of, um, of the instability of five-dimensional black string uh, as, uh, as found by uh, this, uh, this instability of black string was considered by Gregory and Laflamme. Okay, 
So here are uh, our first results. So uh, first of all, we have uh, recovered the, the solutions of Brito et al. Uh, so here are two examples of them. So we plot against R, against R the metric amplitude uh, divided by the Schwarzschild amplitude. So S is the Schwarzschild amplitude, square root of one minus RH over R. And when these ratios are different uh, from one, the solution is different for, from Schwarzschild, basically. So here, close to the horizon, we see that the, the ratio is uh, less than one. So uh, our solution is uh, not Schwarzschild, it's uh, Harry solutions. But asymptotically, the ratio tends to one and the metric tends to flat space time. So we have our massive hair con concentrated close to the horizon. Uh, we have uh, also, we, we see also that Schwarzschild is the only solution if RH is equal to RGL. And uh, then generically, the solution ceases to exist beyond the minimal RH, RH, RH mean, sorry, or a maximal RH max, which are close to RGL. But there is a special case when C3 and minus C4 are greater than one, then the solutions exist for arbitrarily small RH. Uh, we have also considered the, the eta dependence of the solutions. So eta, uh, I remember here the relation with the two gravitational couplings. And um, I will focus on the limit cases. So first, when eta goes to pi over two, uh, the first gravitational coupling is vanishing. And therefore, the, Einstein, the modified Einstein equations for the geometric is exactly uh, the Einstein uh, equations is vacuum. And therefore, in this case, the geometric is exactly Schwarzschild. So we see on the left plot, the ratio n over s and bq over s are equal to one. But the second modified s Einstein uh, equation uh, remains non-trivial and therefore the f metric remains hairy. So we see the, the ratio are different from one for the, for the second metric. And the, the, opposite, uh, the opposite is true when eta goes to zero. In this case, it is, uh, it, it is f mu that, that is Schwarzschild and g mu is Harry. And therefore we call these uh, special solutions Harry Schwarzschild because one of the metric is Schwarzschild while the other is Harry. And uh, these solutions uh, are, are gonna be very important when, um, when, we are, uh, when we will describe physical Harry black holes. So another nice result we have found is the duality relations. So, so far we have, uh, we have found hairy black holes with RH less than RGL. And we always find that UH is greater than RGL. But now we have the interchain symmetry of the massive big gravity because we are in vacuum. And this means that uh, we, we, we should be able to find another solutions, another black hole solutions with RH tilde equals to UH and UH tilde equal to RH. And here is an explicit example of, uh, of uh, dual black holes. So the, the two plots are the same up to the, in, up to the interchange uh, N with Y and Q with little Q. And we also have to interchange U with R and the, the profile are, are the same. And the um, consequences of that is that every solutions exist also for RH greater than RGL. And this was totally uh, new. And uh, this solution was not consider, considered by Brito et al. So now I, with, uh, I, will, uh, I am gonna finish with um, the parameter space for, uh, for spatial value of C3 and C4. And uh, I will uh, talk about the stability analysis also. <clears throat> so we fix C3 and minus C4 to five halves, and then uh, M or eta should be chosen in accordance with cosmological considerations. So in order to have a self-accelerating uh, expansion of the universe driven by an effective cosmological, cosmological constant of order of the inverse of the Hubble radius square, we have two possibilities. Either the graviton mass is very small, so m of order of the inverse of the Hubble radius, or there is a hierarchy between the two couplings, 
namely kappa 1 over kappa 2 is less than 10 to the minus 34, which is equivalent to say that pi over 2 minus kita should be less than 10 to the minus 17. And the, the later possibility is actually needed in order to remove a cosmological uh, an instability in the cosmological background. But we will consider the, 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 two, uh, the two possibilities and see which one is, the better, to do, is, is better to describe uh, physical black holes. So first, here I show the ADM mass of the solutions against the event horizon radius RH. So in red here, we have the curve for Schwarzschild. So it is just RH over 2. And we see that if uh, we are below the GL point, then the Harry solutions for various values so for various values of kappa one are always heavier than Schwarzschild. But if we go uh, above the GL point, the Harry solutions are always lighter than Schwarzschild. Okay, but more importantly, if there is no hierarchy between the two couplings, uh, then the mass which is uh, the dimensionless mass in this plot, is always close to uh, 0 0.45, uh, which is just RGL divided by 2. Uh, the, so we see that all these profiles stay, stay uh, close to, to this value, 0 0.45. <coughs> but if, we ch if, we, if there is a hierarchy between the two couplings, then the minimum, the minimum of the mass becomes deeper and deeper. And actually, the, the, the curves are going to stick more and more to the Schwarzschild curve as we decrease uh, the value of, uh, of kappa 1. And this means that the, since the dimension full mass now is proportional to 1 over m, the physical choice is again to, to choose uh, the hierarchy between the two couplings. Because otherwise, uh, we would have hairy black hole as large as the universe. Because uh, if, if we do not choose the hierarchy between the two couplings, the dimensionless mass is always close to these values, 0 0.45. And then we multiply it by 1 over m, which is a order of the Hubble radius. So we get uh, black holes as large as, as the universe, which is totally ridiculous. So now uh, the parameter space and the stability analysis. So we have found instabilities in the scalar sector of the massive gravitons, and the, the result is uh, as follows. So we have the uh, uh, parameter space of so heta and RH, and we have four different sectors of stability. For example, the one in the top left is a stable sector. This one is unstable. And if we cross the GL point, which is actually now a GL line at 0 0.86, the stability swaps. So we have uh, here a stable sector and here a non-stable sector of the, the hairy uh, backgrounds. So now to, to, to determine what is the physical regions. So first we choose the hierarchy between the two couplings. So eta is very close to pi over two. And then we want our black holes to be stable. So we, we, we stop at the GL point we, we consider this physical region, this thick uh, green line, which is uh, below the, the, the GL point. <clears throat> and we have uh, computed the dimension full mass for these uh, hairy black holes. And their mass can range from stellar black hole values, so, so some, um, some solar masses, to supermassive uh, black hole values of order of 10 to the 6 solar masses. And of course, if we want to describe heavier black holes in massive big gravity, it is also possible because if we cross the, the, the gel point, we are in the domain where uh, the hair solutions are unstable, but Schwarzschild is stable. So heavier black holes can be uh, described by the Schwarzschild uh, solutions. And now it is uh, the time for my conclusions. So first of all, we have confirmed the results of Brito et al. That is, asymptotically flat, hairy black holes do exist in massive big gravity. We have found stable hairy uh, solutions, and they, they are able to describe astrophysical black holes from stellar ones to supermassive ones. 
and they can be the end states for the instability of Schwarzschild in massive big gravity. But uh, we have also found unstable uh, Harris solutions, and they are uh, they exist. There is an unstable sector of uh, of Harry solutions at the same time that Schwarzschild is also unstable. So the final unstate in this case is not very clear because it, it cannot be uh, Harry black holes neither neither Schwarzschild. So this open question remains: What happens to unstable Harry black holes? So for our physical uh, Harry solutions, the G geometry is extremely close to, to Schwarzschild because of the 10 to the minus 34 separations in the Einstein equations uh, of the geometric. Uh, here it is uh, this k power one, which is extremely small. Um, and therefore, the astrophysical Harry black hole hide inside the F metric the Harry features. And if we want to have a chance to, to detect the Harry prints, we need violent dynamical process, like, for example, black hole merger. Uh, and we are also uh, able to say that uh, the hair in prints should be larger for uh, small black holes, because uh, our numerical studies have shown that the metric amplitude of the second metric uh, becomes uh, larger and larger as array. So this is me, the end of my talk. Thank you. And uh, please ask me, ask me some question if you have some. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. And the results are very interesting. Uh, but I, I have some technical uh, question. Uh, you mentioned uh, multiple uh, uh, shooting method yes. that is what does it mean is by one by one or is something more complicated uh what do you mean by uh, one multiple by one? it is a numerical solution by multiple shooting yeah yes uh, yeah but so, uh, can we do some details about how how it is arranged it, it is an algorithm or just uh one by one uh, you shoot uh, uh, it is uh, so actually the, the multiple shooting method is uh, uh, so the not not the multiple one but the standard shooting shooting method is that you start the integration starting from one point so at yeah. RH to an intermediate radius for for the three function n y and u and at the same time you also integrate from R star from uh, an intermediate radius, and then you yeah. ask the amplitude to agree at the intermediate point. And uh, we do this by using a, a Newton a Newton algorithm. Yeah, but you, you have to adjust uh, three parameters at the same time, or you, you do it yes. step by step? Yeah, yes, uh -huh, the uh, same time. yes, we adjust, we adjust the three parameters at the same time. Uh, with the Newton algorithm. So basically, it yeah. transforms uh, the resolutions of uh, ordinary differential equations into a set of algebraic, algebraic like uh, equations at the intermediate, uh, at the intermediate uh, radius. Okay. And the multiple just means that instead of using just two zones, we use many, many zones uh, as need, uh, uh, as many as we need. To avoid the, the, the singularity that arises from the growing uh, the growing mode. Okay, thank you. I don't see more questions. <clears throat> well, so we, we must close our section. I think that we had many interesting talks, and thank you very much for all <laughs> who, who who rests with us. Thank you. Thank you also, okay. and, uh, Nisha, and goodbye. You, you, you like to say something? No, no, I mean, just, just, uh, just uh, thank you, uh, thank you, everybody, for, for, for your contributions. Yeah. Hi. Thank <laughs> you, too. Okay. Bye. 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 Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Oh, no. what? No, I'm not sure that's such a Главное, что мы уложились ровно. Ну да. Результат. Ну да. Ну, да. В общем, а, а вы все остальное слушали? А, все, все, все большие доклады? 
Как вы вообще? Нет, большие я вот какие самые могли бы быть интересные вчера, я пропустил, потому что у меня там другие дела были. А, так, ну, я сидел еще на одной секции тоже, как бы она по термодинамике. Я никак не мог туда войти, я вообще э, не, не в начале, а в конце как раз выступал. И, э, значит, когда стал входить, то мой паспорт не работал. Это продолжалось полчаса. Но, в общем, мне как-то помогли. Вот. А, ну, да, да, да. а так, значит, а... вот ну, особо других не ну, Сегодня я... тоже был, но по, по нашему времени это было уже с утра. То есть я... Я, я краем уха слушал Кера. Ну, да. чего-то мне не очень понравилось. Мне казалось, что это все разглагольствование на хорошо известные темы. Ну, да. Так мне показалось, да, что... Потом там был какой-то совершенно странный доклад на тему, который я, значит, рассказывал на термодинамике. Это вот массовые формулы. Какой-то китаец, это, наверное, специальный китаец, который, значит, я посмотрел потом его публикации, у него, значит, много публикаций и некоторое количество ссылок, но все только автоцитирование. Никто его не цитирует. Он делал пленарный доклад и рассказывал совершенно невероятные вещи. которые, Ну, например, рассказывал, что для Кера до сих пор не, не, не существует массовой формулы правильной, и что нужно там значит, какие-то методы дополнительные к общей теории относительности применять, чтобы ее получить. Ну, в общем, так. Ну, в общем, я мало слышал, мало чего почерпнул пока из этой конференции, не знаю. Ну, я, я, я тоже, может быть, потом, может быть, в записи послушать что-нибудь, но что-то я как-то так... А вот я не понял, сами доклады они выкладывают, они дают... Они, они... Ну, должны, да, то есть у меня какие-то линки они, они присылали, но похоже, что это только линки на нашу секцию, но, наверное... Так они, быть, нет, линки. они линки на видеозаписи присылают, а не на сами слайды. Нет, как, подождите, сейчас какие-то линки ведь были, какие-то, сейчас я посмотрю. Почему? Подождите, но вы ваш доклад выкладывали в сеть? Так он же записан автоматически, вот сейчас докладывают все автоматически. Так он, он автоматически вас... записан в видеорежиме? Нет, это, это все обрабатывается и выкладывается, то есть это, это они занимаются, за что мы деньги нет, платим? Нет, я понимаю, но нет, выкладывается просто сами, сами слайды, это же было бы проще, чем... Слушать весь доклад – это очень долго. А, не, не, нет, 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 конечно же, вся, вся конференция должна будет в YouTube где-то. Конечно, вся. А, ну, ну, например, Но именно в, видео, в видеозаписи, в видеозаписи. Нет, вот то, что сейчас мы видели, то же самое и будет. Все изображения там, авторов, которые говорят… Вот, вот, пожалуйста, мне, 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 мне линки с, с, с YouTube, вот, вот сейчас пришли какие-то. Да-да-да, нет, это я понимаю. Да. Но, но мне это больше бы понравилось, если бы были просто слайды. Ну, а, слайды? PDF-файлы, PDF-файлы, да. А, ну, так вы, вы, вы же можете перематывать в YouTube, то есть если, если вам долго слушать, то вы можете перематывать. Нет, ну, в принципе, да. В принципе, конечно, да. Ну, да. Вот. Ну вот, ладно. Вот, вот, а вот. что там вообще разбирались, что там еще интересного будет завтра, послезавтра? По, по параллельным да. сервисам? Нет, я вообще не смотрел. Тут у меня, да, у меня тут что-то много всяких А завтра, завтра какие-то что, что ли параллельные секции будут еще? Я, я даже О, не да. Я... А у Кунц, конч... у Кунц кончились? У, у Кунц у нее, у нее вторая секция была. Я не знаю, то есть у, у нее параллель одновременно с нами, то есть должна быть кончилась. У нее было 17 спикеров, а у нас, значит, сколько? У нас, у нас 14 получается. То есть, ну, у, нее, у нее тоже наверняка. Наверное, Но вы у нее были, и, и что-то там я, друг, другое я, служили еще, да? Ну, да нет, я, 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 я доложил свой, свой, свой доклад, а потом мне нужно было к Старбинскому переключаться. И, в общем я потом... mm -hmm. Ну, ну что-то у нее так довольно кисло было, честно говоря. Вот. Я у нее спросил, в чем, в чем сейчас суть черных дыр. Она не знает, в чем суть черных дыр. Это, в общем, что, что она что она делает, непонятно. Но сама она делает только эти самые вращающиеся облака. 
это у них мода сейчас кера, ну, знаете, эти клауд, спиннинг клаудс, что называется. Ну и вот, в общем, так вот. Ну ладно тогда, в общем, передавайте всем привет. Спасибо, да. Ну и вы тоже имеете слово. Ладно, ладно, ладно. Ладно. До всего. До свидания. Ладно, завершаем, да? Давайте, закроемся, а то они сейчас нас отключат. Я думаю, сами.